it's Andy Campbell! It's in! Campbell comes off the bench to be a hero! A superhero! Breakthrough! It's taken a while, but it's been worth the wait for Cardiff City! Hey guys, I'm Sai and welcome to H Podcast Nation, but more importantly, welcome to episode number 45, 45, 45 episodes of the Andy Campbell Show, absolutely flown by as uh, we hurtle towards Project Restart, lots to talk about, but as usual, as we just wait for people to join us in the chat, I'll go through a couple of links, as always, uh, we're sponsored and uh, supported by Black Diamond Sports. Uh, we thank them for their support as always and uh, also you can catch this show and all the other podcasts videos and content we do youtube.com slash ace podcast nation if you really want to help us out you can subscribe there that's really helpful and uh, you can get the audio versions of all the shows at the usual podcasting and radio apps uh apple podcasts spot spotify stitcher all them usual good stuff joining me as ever my partner in crime co-host Ex Middlesbrough striker, Cardiff City legend, David Jones' favourite son, Mr. Andy Campbell. How are you, sir? I'm all right, mate. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm I listen. These Mondays are, are saving uh, saving the world at the minute, and I'm. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, to have the person next to me. There we are. That one. Uh, yeah. Can't wait. Can't wait for this. So I'm just going to halt the show straight away. Just halt the show. We've had the first comment referring to yesterday. I did the MMA show with the former Cage Warriors champion. I, I answered uh, that, by the way, didn't I? Danny Batten. And uh, he said, or someone in the chat said, that you should fight him for charity. Uh, <laughs> promoted by Ace Podcast Nation. I couldn't fight sleep. Straight away, James Costley in the comments. Are you fighting Andy? Is, is, is James going to train me then? Yeah. You need someone, mate. You'll have to <laughs> someone, won't you? I need Jesus to train me. I'm here. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, time is time is everything, John. Time is everything. That's it. And joining us is former. I'm going to miss a club out now. I know it. Former Manchester United, Middlesbrough, Fulham, West Brom, Nottingham Forest, York City midfielder, Mr. Jonathan Green. And how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on your show. No, that's great. I'll be on, mate. Absolutely delighted. Top man. Crap. Just, apolo- just apologise for the stalking, mate, because uh, I-, I normally get me way eventually. <laughs> <laughs> you like my missus, man. <laughs> so, I'm uh, I'm bringing in something uh, something from the other podcasts I do. Is what we do is we have something called quick fire questions. So we're going to sl- change it slightly. We're going to call it the Magnificent Seven, and uh, we- this is the first one, John. So it's uh, especially for you. It's come back or it's, it's come across from the other shows. And uh, all you have to do is you have to answer seven questions back to back. Just say the first thing that comes to mind. Under pressure now, aren't I? Under pressure. You are. It just lets people get a feel. But like a word, a word association. It's, it's fine. Yeah, that's it. It just it lets the people know what you're into. Okay. Okay, mate. So, uh, Messi or Ronaldo? Messi. Oasis or the Beatles? Oasis. Ooh. Steve McLaren or Brian Robson? Ooh. Can I say both? Because I like them both. Ooh. Cop out if ever I've heard one. I'm going, I'm going Robbo because we, we like to have a drink. Ah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And uh, Ryan Giggs or Lee Sharp? Ryan Giggs. Even though I absolutely loved Lee Sharp when I was younger, I loved him. Uh, the Sharpie Truffle loved him. So, But I'm going to go Giggsy. And uh, Fergie or Roy Keane, who's scarier? <laughs> <laughs> That's bloody hard, that mate. Because Fergie's is an absolute animal, and so is Kino. I'm gonna go Kino. Uh, best roommate, Paul Robinson, the left back from West Brom. West Brom, yeah. Uh, worst trainer. Oh, I've had a few of them. Uh, <laughs> I might go Cam- Cammy's brother. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be watching as well. He was a terrible trainer. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So that's uh, that's the magnificent seven. That's got us uh, started. So 
uh, I think, again, I've seen, there seems to be a problem with my audio on uh, Facebook, so I'm just going to have a look into that. So, Andy, you take over for just a second. Have a look right, no worries. On. So, uh, John, I've got, a, I've got a starting question. So, I think it's the question that every football fan, especially in the, in the, in the North East, wants to know. So, basically, is obviously, the pinnacle of your career was, uh, was playing um, with me and my brother. Uh, but who is the best player out of me and my brother? Oh, that's a that's a great question. You put me right on, on my toes now, aren't you? Uh, I'm going to go with you, mate. Not just because you're producing and interviewing me, but I think you had you had a, just a little bit more pace, and a little bit better touch, and uh, you, you didn't you, you didn't lose your head as much as your brother. <laughs> You'll be losing it right now. I've just had a message of his girlfriend telling me that. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be Facebook will be like. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. No, I, I, oh, listen. A little bit of fun to start off with, mate. Uh, let's right. Listen, you've had an unbelievable career. Um, you know, what I mean, it was obviously great that um, you know I mean, we crossed paths really early in your life, uh, and obviously in my life as well, with uh, with obviously the connection with my with my brother. But obviously, you signed for York City at a obviously at a really young age. Uh, where obviously when I was knocking around in the in the U team at Middlesbrough. But so why York City? Why how did how did things like that start? Well, it was the only team who wanted to sign me. To be to be fair, can I? Mean, right, okay. Um, I was, I was like 14, 15, st still playing for my um, grassroots team. You know, obviously I was a striker back in the day and I was banging yeah. like 40, 50 goals in a season, scoring goals from a district side, from a York North Yorkshire side. And uh, I wasn't getting snapped up or anything. And then uh, just before I turned 15, I got spotted by uh, Ricky Spears, who used to work for uh, Sunderland as well. He was, he was the a top York coach. He was a top yeah, coach, though, wasn't he? Was he? The, he was the youth, oh, top coach, yeah. He was the yeah. youth team manager at... At York at the time, I think, you know, he'd spotted me or one of his scouts had spotted me and asked me to go on trial. So I went on trial and um, when I was about, just before my 15th birthday, I ended up signing schoolboys. So I had two years, obviously, doing the schoolboy scholarships. And then just before the end of the two years, I put, I was probably one of the last ones to find out that I was going to get a YTS, obviously. You know what it's like. You, you, you're yeah. desperate to get the YTS to get give, you, give yourself yeah. a chance. And, yeah, what happened to me know, as well? It happened to yeah. me as well that, yeah, that I think people were signing schoolboy forms, YTS forms, and it, when you're hanging on to the last minute and, and your parents are in a meeting, you know what I mean? You, sometimes you fear the worst, but you know what I mean? Uh, and that, that, I think that follows me on that, you know what I mean? So that, so personally then, you know what I mean? That um, Was that the right progression for you, you know what I mean? To, to go to a club where you were uh, more or less going to be thrust into reserve team football, youth team football and first team football training and games? Yeah, I mean, you know, we had a real good um, um, schoolboy team. You know, Lee Matthews was up front with me at the time and he ended up going to Leeds for a bit of money at the time. And Do you remember Lee Matthews? He was a yeah, top yeah, I played with really Lee at Martin, yeah. Yeah, and then um, obviously, you know, when I signed the, the YTS, I thought, you know, I've got two years to give it a good chance to get a first year pro and that's all was in my head, really. And, um, you know, um, I went into my, my scholarship, uh, what they call it now, the YTS. And um, yeah. to be fair, I absolutely, my first year was terrible. I was probably too skinny, too weak. Technically, I was quite a good player, but um, I didn't really play in the youth team in my first year. And it wasn't until the summer where I had to go away, get fitter, get stronger. And I came back, started playing regularly in the youth team and uh, got, got into the reserves and started getting really confident. And ended up captaining in the youth team. Um, was when I, I really started believing in my own ability, even though I knew I was a good player. I didn't know I was going to go as far as I did, but I was just trying to get a first year pro like everybody does, like your brother did, like you did, yeah. and just get just get onto the um, you know um, the first team manager's radar really. And that's that was that's what was always in my head. Perfect. You know what I mean? For me, I don't think you can connect me. You never get those times back. You know, YTS days are the best. You know what I mean? Every player will tell you. I don't know what it's like nowadays with being a scholar, but the YTS days are the best ever. You know what I mean? The, the things that you had to put up with, the things that you had to do, um, cleaning boots, scrubbing toilets, you know what I mean? The hours that you put in, you can be you can be at the training ground for eight o'clock in the morning. Sometimes you didn't get home till midnight. You know what I mean? And it was just, and then you're back in again tomorrow, seven days a week. Sometimes without a day off, it was the best time in the world, wasn't it? It was just, it's just, it's just never going to get them times back. But everyone always remembers it. It's the best time, best time of my life. I mean, you know, I just lived in the digs around the corner with like sixteen yeah. other players. Richard Creswell, one of my good mates, and your your brother's good mates, um, was obviously there as well. A year old who helped me out because I knew quite well. But like you say, you know, cleaning boots. So pushing corridors, mopping floors, doing yeah. the boots. I mean, you know, getting doing coffees for the first team players, getting abused by the first team players. It can't it wouldn't happen now. I remember getting locked in the boot room at um Boothham Crescent, um, lights taken off. Do you remember the metal the metal uh, scrubbers used to sit in the mud yeah, off the yeah, back for of the boots? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't yeah. clean one of one of the lads' um, boots. So they shut me in there, 
literally got the metal scraper down my hamstrings and calves until they're all bleeding. <laughs> like, if it happened nowadays, you'd get absolutely uh, crucified. Totally, yeah. totally. Um, but I absolutely it, loved it, that's the thing. But it was like Christmas time, wasn't it? You know what I mean? Christmas where you had to sing a song in front of the first team and, uh, and the worst yeah. singer, you know what I mean? I don't know what it was like in every other club. Every, everyone had, had little little quirks and little different, you know what I mean? If it happens, this happened nowadays, it would be... Uh, we frowned upon, but obviously singing at Christmas, the worst singer at the, uh, be naked and running around Essen Park, you know, with no clothes on, and all the players watched, and all the staff, all the other staff watched, and it was just, it was one of those things what just brought you together as a group, you know what I mean? It stayed in house, everything was just fun, everything was energetic, and it was just, it just made me the person that I am, and just, it just made me enjoy going to work. I just loved going in. I never, I never worried about the, the, you know, what I mean, the first team players about getting shouted at, about about giving the ball away in training and having a bad game. It was just always just about enjoying and, and enjoying the moment, really. Yeah, it gave you the grounding, didn't it? I think you know, for yeah. me, you know, I had a paper round from eight years old up until twelve, and I worked in a chippy like three nights a week until I was sixteen. So when I went to York, I was quite used to hard work, but. You know, we used to, we used to, like you say, we used to be in at eight o'clock in the morning. We used to do all the jobs until half ten, and then we train for a couple of hours, then do all the jobs in the afternoon, like seven yeah. days a week. I remember cleaning, um, cleaning Boom Crescent's pitch with estate agents' boards because it was full of snow, and we we had to do it literally to try and get a game on. And it was me and all the youth team players with these estate agent boards scraping the snow off for about seven hours so the game could be played. Got to an hour before kickoff, and the game was bloody cancelled. Game called off. Absolutely devastated. It happened the same as us. The same as us. We, we were supposed to play. We were supposed to play Villa at the Riverside, and uh, and we did the, we did the pitch. Got the pitch immaculate. Got all the snow off, and then the game got called off because of the roads. <laughs> the roads outside, and it was just heartbreaking. Yeah, the, yeah, best, the best. The best time of your life. But then, what came through that is obviously a, a an unbelievable opportunity and a move to. The world's best football club, obviously. Uh, Nick Culkin, did Nick, Nick, did Nick move as well at the same time as you were? Did he move at a separate time, obviously? No, Nick moved about two uh, two years before me. He was a, did he, he was a he? year older than me. Yeah, he went about so obviously, so obviously there was a obviously then there was a good link between the two clubs. You know what I mean? There was a there was a good bit of respect. I know I know. I remember Neil um, uh, played at Old Trafford uh, in the League Cup when York went there, and I think they beat them two or three nil. It was quite comfortable, and York yeah. had a good side. They, had the, they, they were always bringing good young players through. But tell me how the how the move came about to Man United. Well, uh, the first I first found out about it. We played. Um, your brother might have played in the game. He might remember it. But uh, we played um, a reserve game on a Tuesday night. Um, it was just before they just offered me first year pro, and we were playing against Sheffield United reserves. And obviously, back in the day, they used to play all you know the the ex pros, the older pros, you know, not not like nowadays in the under twenty threes. You know, yeah. a lot of the first team players used to play, and they had a really good team out. And uh, we won the game four 0 and I scored all four. And my mum and dad were there actually watching the game, and they were going in to try and sort my contract out with the chairman, um, who was a bit tight at the time. And I was on like thirty eight quid at the time, and um, they offered me, I think. 90 quid a week for, for, for two years um, to stay on as a first year pro and a second year pro. And my mum and dad were like trying to get something like 105 quid and 110 quid or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, a couple of days later, the deal sl- still wasn't sorted and I hadn't signed the, the, my first year pro uh, at the time. Um, and then we got an inkling that there was a scout at the game from United uh, who was really impressed with me. Obviously, I scored four goals, got man of the match and... Uh, they said they were going to watch me for for six months to a year. So that was the first time we ever heard of it. But then after that, you know, it went on for six months, seven months. I got I signed my first year pro. I ended up getting a massive 135 quid a week, which was mega money back in the day. Well, huge uh, money. Uh, <laughs> and then um, we played a first team game. I think it was March 98 or something like that. We played um, Fulham at home and I actually started the game up front. I can't remember who, who I played up front with. Uh, we lost the game one 0 and I played absolutely terrible. So I'm walking out with uh, Boovan Crescent down the tunnel. And I'm just trying to put my head down because I'm thinking the gaff that Alan Little, who was quite a bit like Fergie, you know, yeah, he yeah. had that fear factor about him. Um, I was trying to walk by his office so he didn't see me because I played that bad. You know yourself when you played bad. And um, all I heard was John can have a word, and I was like, oh no, he's going to absolutely rip into me here. So I sat down and thinking he's going to go all guns blazing, and he just said, listen. Fan Alex Ferguson on the phone, he wants you to go training on a Monday for four days. Um, we think it's a good opportunity for you. What do you think? And I was like, yeah, good one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know when, when's, when's the bollocking going to come? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, he, he just said, no, listen, I'm being serious. So that's how it came about. I ended up going to United on the Sunday night by train because I couldn't drive at the time. Uh, trained the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with the first team with Keno, Bex, Giggs, E. Scholes, all them. And then on the Thursday afternoon, when I was getting the train back to um, to York, because we had a game on the Saturday, 
Alex Ferguson pulled me in and just said, listen, you know, you've been terrific over the last four days. We really like you. You've been one of the best trialists we've had in. Um, we're going to watch you for a bit and, um, you know, we really like you kind of thing. So I, I went back on the train thinking, you know, I mean, Alex Ferguson's lying out of his backside here. You know, he's just trying to make me, make me happy and send me back to York. Um, or he does quite like me kind of thing, but I didn't yeah. know which way, which way it was. And then uh, yeah, yeah. I went back to York, started playing the first team. And then I, and a little just called me one day and said, listen, we've agreed a fee um, with United. I think it was £500,000 and another £500,000 in appearances. Um, you, you, you're free to go and talk to uh, United. And uh, I didn't have an agent at the time. So I was panicking like mad, didn't know what to do. So me me and my mum and dad just went over to um, United and, and ended up walking around the, tra- the training ground, the old Cliff training ground at the time with Alex Ferguson and uh, ended up signing straight away. Um, signed for absolutely peanuts, just wanted to sign for one of the best clubs in the world. Um, I was a United fan, so it was an absolute dream come true. I ended up yeah. signing three years on something like... 400 quid, 450, 500. <laughs> yeah. I think, that, well, I think that's the thing though, isn't it? You know, sorry, Si. I think that's the thing that, that, that you, you go to a club that you love. Money's irrelevant, isn't it? And I think that that's just forgotten nowadays. I think people first and foremost ask how much instead of thinking about the, about the team and about the club and about the heritage and about just wanting to play football or wanting to learn from the best managers or players. Yeah, definitely. I think you're totally right. I think for me, you know, and probably... I'm sure you're in the same boat as me. As a young kid, I just absolutely loved football. I played it, you know, day and night, you know, every every minute of the day I could. You know, as many games a week as I could. I used to play two games on a Saturday, two games on a Sunday. I used to play, you know, all the way through the week, games on the night, five side with my dad on the Tuesday and Thursday night with adults, you know, from probably 11 years old. All I wanted to do was play football. I watched every single game on football, on TV. All I wanted to do was play football. So to get the chance at York and then, you know, a year later, get a chance to go to a big club, big club like United, it wasn't about the money, it was just about, you know, signing for one of the biggest clubs in the world that were absolutely flying at the time. I supported them and I thought, what a chance this is. Mm. In um, in hindsight, uh, John, do you think, like, when you look back at it, do you feel like you could have waited to go to United or do you think it was just an opportunity you had to take at that time? To be fair, I mean, I could not turn it down. I think at the time, I think Tottenham came in for me as well. Um, I, think, I think George Graham was the manager at the time. And Tottenham's team probably wasn't the best, you know, at, at that time, um, in that era. And uh, I remember my dad saying to me, because my dad's a Spurs fan, actually, actually he's actually, he was born in London. And um, he said, why, you know, why don't you go to Tottenham? You've probably got a better chance of playing. Um, or at least go and speak to them and see what they're saying. I just said, Dad, listen, you know, you're talking about Man United here, the history mm. of the club, you know. Um, I love watching all, you know, we talked about Sharpie early on, Lee Sharp and uh, Brian Robson, who obviously managed me early, uh, later on in my career. Uh, Mark Hughes, who, who managed me as well. You know, Eric Cantona and players like that. I just thought, listen, I need to go there and, you know, uh, give it a good crack. And, you know, it's the best three years I've ever had. You know, I learned so much going to United, you know, how to look after myself, you know, the mentality of the players. Um, people like Roy Keane who just demand, you know, every day in training. And I think me going there for them three years made me have the career I had because, you know, I ended up, you know, learning from them, you know, being the first into training ground every morning, being one of the last to leave, doing extra before and extra after, you know, asking questions how I can get better. Um, because you're always, you're always striving to be a better player um, because, you know, you always got somebody trying to take your place, as, as Cammy knows, you know, um, mm. there's always somebody who's trying to get your spot on the team. So it was a perfect, perfect grounding for me going to United for them three years. But I think also, though, John, opportunities don't come um, like that very often. You know that you know. I mean, sometimes that when an opportunity of a football club like that comes, you can't have a regret. You know what I mean? And I think sometimes if you don't make those kind of moves and and those 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 don't come, you said earlier on about that's the reason why you had the, the career you had because you went to you went to York instead of looking around and waiting for a bigger and better club. And then same same with Man United that you just said there about. Sometimes training and learning off these kind of players is just as good sometimes as, as playing football at a younger age because, you know what I mean, for me, I, I learned so much from the um, the superstars at Middlesbrough, the Ravinelli's and the Boxich and the, and the, and the, um, the Emerson's, for example. And yeah. you know, I didn't get to play as much football as I would have liked at, at, at the age after getting a little bit of a taste. But sometimes you've got to swallow it and just suck it up and get on with it sometimes and just, and just understand that the reason you're not playing is because you're getting kept out because of world-class footballers. Yeah, 100% true. And I think, you know, for me, my three years at United was a learning curve as well because, yeah, I probably won't, I only made 34 appearances in three years, but 
every season I probably played 20, 25 reserve games as well, playing with, you know, the, the other first team players who obviously weren't playing in the first team, you know, the likes of David May and people like that who were so experienced as well. But the big, biggest thing I, I learned from it was, you know, I went to United thinking I was going to be a striker. They signed me as a striker. And I only played, my debut I played um, up front um, with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer against Bury at Old Trafford. Uh, we won, I think it was 2-1. I, I set Oli up a goal. We got man of the match. And that's the only ever time I ever played up front again. Um, after that, I was playing left wing, right wing, centre mid. And I've never, ever played them positions in my whole life. So I had to sort of like not reinvent myself. But I had to learn on the job, you know. When I, when I first got put in the team um, at right, right wing, and, you know, I was think I was absolutely petrified because Alex Ferguson, the coach, didn't tell me, you know, what to do. You know, there was no coaching. Yeah, yeah. It was not like nowadays where you get, you know, specific coach, coaching positions. Yeah. I had to literally learn on the job. So I was playing right wing. I was thinking, right, what do I need to do? I need to watch what Kicks is doing when we've got the ball and what, what he's doing when, we, when he hasn't got his ball. So I was just sort of like, you know, uh, learning every day on the job, really. And, uh, you know, then I'd play centre midfield, you know, in the in, in the cup against Sunderland at the Stadium of Light. And I was thinking, you know, I've never played centre mid, mid before as well, you know, in this kind of game, yeah. you know, in front of 48,000 people. And, you know, I played with Phil Neville and, you know, I was just doing what he was try, trying to do, you know, and I just learned it all myself and, the biggest thing I can I took out from it is was like I said earlier the standards of training you know uh, always wanting the ball you know don't worry about making mistakes and um, literally you know it was the best thing I ever did was going there for them three years. Um, going up on a point you just said there about uh, about playing in different positions, did the manager tell you then that you were going to play in different positions, or did he tell you that um, you know I mean he sees you as a, a right winger, a centre midfielder, not a centre forward? Because I think um, Fergie did did that pretty well with players that he, he made them multitask and played in different positions because you know what I mean instead of just being a one trick pony, for example, you know what I mean? he did it with Phil Neville, played right back, left back, you know what I mean he played uh, Dennis Irwin left back, he's a right footer. You know, I mean, Ryan's played in every position at, at Man United, you know, <laughs> yeah. so, you know what I mean? And probably the yeah. same as school, you know, the players. So, is that what he did with you? Yeah, no, he didn't. No, I mean, literally, it's, it's a weird situation because, you know, obviously, like I said, you know, I went as a striker and signed me as a striker. For the three years I was there, every time I played for the reserves, I played in front. I think, you know, I, you know, I was scoring like 15, 20 goals every year for them three years. And every time I played for the reserves, I always played up front as a striker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but every time I played for the first team, it was either left wing or right wing um, or, or centre mid. And uh, he never once told me, I mean, the first, like I said to you, the first time he, he told me I was playing on the wing, I was like, he didn't even tell me, you know, he didn't even ask me if I've ever played that position before. He, he didn't give me any clues on how to play it. Do you know what I mean? He didn't even ask yeah, me yeah. if I'd played it. So it was literally just learning on the job. And I think, um, you know, as a player, you either sink or you swim. And I think that's why, you know, not being big headed or anything like that, I just think, you know, because I'm quite a relaxed person and quite uh, laid back, I just took it in my strides and thought, you know, when he told me I was playing that position, I just thought, right, I can do this. Yeah. You know, um, I, can, I can give it a whirl. What's what's the worst that can happen kind of thing? And I just mm. thought, like, like I said, you know, if I was playing centre midfield, I'd see what the other centre midfielders were doing and I'd just try and replicate it. Same when I was playing on the wings. And obviously, the more... The more I did, the more confident I got. You know, the better I was probably playing. And um, you know, um, it, when you've been when you're at United, you got te- you got to be technically quite good, which I always yeah. thought I was was quite technically quite good. Yeah, yeah you were. So um, you know, it was just trying to do the other things really, and you know, the, maybe the other side of the game, like tracking back and stuff like that, because I was, obviously I wasn't used to that being a, being a striker. You, I don't think you've ever tracked back in your life. Have you, Ken? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> probably didn't do it for probably about twelve or thirteen years. No, until uh, <laughs> until you probably get a little bit older, then you start a little bit further back. So then you probably have to. But I think when you when you're last man, it's. You know what I mean? I think certain managers, though, they, they, they tell you not to do it. You know what I mean? There's certain players, Jamie Vardy, for example, you know what I mean? He's spending Rodgers, tells him to stay on the shoulder and, you know what I mean, save your energy to, to, to hurt the other yeah. sides. And, you know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a part of the game now. You know what I mean? If you, you know what I mean? Jamie, Jamie Vardy, when he first signed for Leicester, he's running here there and everywhere. And he's wasting his energy. And, and then he's timing himself out a little bit. And he's probably got to be super fit to, to, to enable the runs to be made later on in the game. And sometimes you've just got to be a bit, little bit more cleverer to, to save your energy for when, when you've got the ball. You play to people's strengths, don't you? Like, if you look at, totally. like, Jamie Vardy is a perfect example. You play to his strengths, he's over the mm. top, his pace, you know, you don't yeah. want him tracking back. Whereas you've got someone like Wayne Rooney who likes dropping the little pockets, yeah. you know, as fit as a fiddle, strong as an ox, he can mm. do tracking back, you know, he can do everything. That's probably why yeah. Ronaldo was so successful when they yeah. were in the United team together. So you just play to people's strengths, that's the case. Yeah, no, totally. And I think, that, I think that's where... 
especially Sir Alex and all the top managers in the Premier League at the minute, that they um, that they find the perfect jigsaw pieces and put them all together. You know what I mean? And complement each player like individually. You know what I mean? You you, you on about Jamie Vardy there? He's got. James Madison just behind him, you know that he's got these kind of players who can feed the, the ball into certain areas yeah. and, and come come short for the ball, go long for the ball. He's got a, they've got a good mix and good blend, and every single Premier League side it seems as though they've, they've, they've got the blend, and you know what I mean. But that can go back, you know what I mean. The top managers like Sir Alex and um, yeah, Kevin Keegan, for example, you know what I mean. They they started this years and years and years yeah. ago and and uh, and implemented those kind of uh, strengths and, and things into their sides. So John, you know when. With obviously the the youth team, the re, the reserve side, the the first team at the time you joined, United were absolutely in their pomp. You know they obviously you were there when they won the treble. Um, the, the depth and quality, even in the youth teams, does that mean that there's a lot of, a lot more pressure than perhaps you know if you play a youth team elsewhere because everyone was, you know there were some massive names in that youth team and the re, reserves. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously when I went to United as a 19-year-old, there was some, you know, some good players coming through. You know, Wes Brown, there was, you know, Phil Mill Ryan who was there at the time, uh, Michael Clegg, uh, Alex Notman, David Healy, uh, Eric Nevelin. There were some really, really good young players. And like you say, and, and that's just naming a few, there was, you know, there was plenty of more good players. Um, but when I, when I first went, I just I just had the, um, the mentality of, right, they've signed me for a bit of money. Um, I've got nothing to lose. It's a massive chance. I know I'm technically good enough. If I can work on the other side of the game, my fitness and strength and stuff, obviously with the training ground compared to what your, your training ground's like, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to be, become a better player. And like when I was playing for the, the reserves and stuff like that, like I mentioned, all ex-pros playing as well, who always helped you and give you encouragement. And like, you know, Cammy said earlier, you learn from these players all the time. And uh, But in, in, my, in my mindset, I was just trying, so focused on um, getting in the first team and you know being part of the first team for you know you know I know it's a team game but sometimes you've got to be selfish and think of yourself so like I said earlier you know I used to do extra training before training after you know to show the coach you know people that call it busy now don't they but you know just mm -hmm. to show the coaches that you want to be become better and uh, you know then you get the chance to train with the first team every day I mean I that the year we won the treble you know I probably trained with the first team Every single day, I travel to most away games, uh, home games in the squad. Yeah, sometimes, I, most of the time, I was 19th man, the, the one left out. But, you know, I was always travelling with them to away games. You know, we used to do Champions League games on Tuesday night. I'd come back at like three or four o'clock in the morning. The next day, I, I had to go and play a reserve game at Gig Lane. So, I had to get the mindset where, you know, I've had no rest. I've come home, I'd be any sleep. I've got to go and play a reserve game against Liverpool, for instance, and uh, try and put performance on. Because if you're not performing in the reserves... You know, and score don't get goals, opportunity, like, do you? Yeah. yeah, you don't get the opportunity to train mm. with the first team and, and, and travel mm. with the squad. So, so for my part, you know, I, I was just concentrating on myself, and I think I did that well because obviously, you know, um, I got the rewards at the end of the season by being part of the, the the Premier League final squad and the FA Cup final squad and the Champions League final squad, which was a dream come true. I pick up on a point you just said that said there, John. So you said obviously. Um... Training with the first team and stuff. Did you feel like a first team player at Man United? Because you obviously you got bought. You, you know what I mean. You were, you know what I mean. You left a, a le you left a, a decent legacy at York City with a with a, a decent chunk of transfer money. So you know what I mean. So you, you went there as a as a transfer feed player. So did you feel like a first team player at United? I'd say not at first. I'd say because um, because you know you're going into a, a t well a team of world world stars, aren't you? You know, yeah, yeah. David Beckham, Roy Keane, Peter Schmeichel. You know, Yapstam, players like that of that ilk, mm -hmm. you know, Giggsy, mm -hmm. you know, Coley, Yorkie and uh, Teddy. And, you know, Teddy Sheridan was one of my heroes, you know, uh, Euro 96. And, you know, so at first it's a bit strange. But what I'd say about the United dream was th there was no egos whatsoever. You know, you, you look at them as superstars. But like, you know, you played with Ravnelli and people like that. They're not. They're just like normal lads, and you know, normal I, human beings, aren't they? And they're, yeah, they're there I mean, to do. They're there to do a job. They're there to, they're yeah, there to I mean, be, a, be a footballer. I honestly, I remember my first day of training after I'd signed. We'd signed, and I trained, trained with the first team. And just as we were finishing training, Gary Neville said, "Oh, by the way, we're going to uh, paintball this afternoon, team bonding day, and then we're going for a few beers afterwards." This is my first day at Man United, one of the biggest clubs <laughs> in the world, by the way. <laughs> Right, and I was like, "Well, I ain't got, I ain't got any clothes or anything." I was in digs. I'd literally just bought a few tracksuits over from York, and they're like, "Oh, we'll sort your pair of jeans out in a t-shirt and that, whatever." And we ended up going paintball in the afternoon. And then we went and sit in the pub, playing all card games and stuff like that, and shots. And then we went out into Manchester. Next morning, I'm waking up and I'm thinking, 
I just signed for the biggest club in the world and we're just having the most biggest ever. <laughs> <laughs> it, was like, it was like I was back at York City. <laughs> Uh, well, I think it's all. Right, but I bet that was. I bet that. Bet, bet that helped all with the settling in process. You know. Yeah. That, you know what I mean? That you've got the biggest players in the world still doing normal things, and I think yeah. uh, I'll, I'll call it a drinking culture because drinking culture was it was around at that time, and it was. Um, yes, it's socialising now, but you know what I mean. That the players did it, but they still turned up for training the next day, and they still worked hard, and they still did everything yeah, what was expected right. from them. But to answer your question, did I feel like a first team player? It gradually, as it as time went on, I'd say because I was scoring goals in the reserves, I was training yeah. every day, I was travelling with the squad. Um, but I would I would say that I probably my three years there, like I said to you earlier, was the best three years I've ever had. But I wouldn't say, I I mean Alex Ferguson offered me a new contract to stay, but I needed to go out and play regularly, like you know, you know, you yeah, start yeah. playing week in week out. I was twenty two at the time, and I'd only played thirty four appearances, and they just signed um, Veron for thirty four million and Van Nistelrooy. I was thinking, there's no way I'm going to play, but Fergie wanted me to stay. He believed in me. He offered me new contracts. But at the end of my three years, I do believe that I was part of the first team squad. But I, could, I would say I probably wasn't good enough to be, you know, in the first team squad as a starter. You know, mm. um, maybe given a, a bit more game time in them three years. Um, you know, because I remember a few times I'd played, I'd played a game and I've got man of the match doing really well. Like I wouldn't play for three months. Yeah. You know, so maybe looking back, if if he'd have played me for eight, nine, ten games in a row, uh, then maybe things would have been different. But at the end of my three years, I probably, yes, I was a first team player, but I probably wasn't good enough in that squad because it was a world class squad to be actually mm. a starter for Man United at that time uh, in that, that present era. I think that's what people don't understand, though, do they? You know, that, that when you play, you just want to play. And when you're playing well, you want to continue playing. And sometimes when you get brought out as a young player, Yes, it's to protect you, and yes, it's to it's to nurture you in the right way. But you know, I mean, sometimes you just want to play. You're raw. You're hungry. You just want to. You're not scared. You're not nervous. You just want to go and play. And you know, what I mean, sometimes you don't take it the right way that the manager explains or doesn't explain. Sometimes that you know, that, but it's just to protect you. And I think it's only when you get older and you see these kind of players getting rested that you know what I mean. And it's happened throughout. But sometimes yeah. you know, what I mean, different managers have their own different ways of doing things. And you know what I mean? But as a young player, sometimes you just want to go and play. And then if you don't play, you're frustrated and you're thinking that you're doing something wrong. And it's hard to get your head around sometimes. Yeah, it's hard to get your head around. I think, you know, I remember we played Bradford at uh, Old Trafford and I set a couple of goals. I got a man in the match, 1-5-1. I think it was live on Sky on a Monday night or something. And I didn't play again for about six weeks. And it just absolutely knocked my confidence. Even though I was, you know, even though I played so well, got a man in the match, set a couple of goals, playing right wing out of position. And, I, you know, it just knocks your confidence a bit and it knocks out your stride and then you start getting yeah. a little bit, you know, disheartened. And I know, you know, like United were an unbelievable team, were unbelievable players. And I'm, not, I'm not saying I deserve to, you know, play in week out. But, you know, when you play a game like that, deep down you think, well, I deserve another crack at it because I played so yeah. well. Do you know what I mean? And it yeah, does totally get a little bit disheartening and upsetting, but that, totally that's, that's just football for you. Yeah, totally agree. So you're a big Man United fan, aren't you? Yeah, I'm pissed. <laughs> What's the best moment? Is what best moment when when, when John was there as a Man United fan? Well, it's probably the Champions League final when he sat. On Champions the League final, the yeah. Champions League but final, I pinnacle. Say, I remember that day vividly. I was in Ryder Arms. Uh, Good pub, by the way. Good pub, by the way. That the best pub. <laughs> but, uh, it is amazing. Talking about amazing, that, start, amazing. Start tearing up if I talk about. Spend that. some Sundays in there. Um, just going back to Fergie, I wanted to ask you, John. Um, like obviously, I think. And I would say, arguably, a lot of people think that Fergie's the the greatest manager of all time. But not just that, but particularly for developing young players into world class players. Why, as from your personal point of view and your experience, but also generally, like, why do you think he was so good at developing those young players? Because no one has ever been able to to replicate what he did, bringing you know players through as well as signing big players. Yeah, well, I think even, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson, you know, says that, you know, Eric Harrison was a massive influence, you know, in the youth team and Brian Kidd as well at the time, you know, bringing the young players through. Obviously, you're probably never going to get a crop like the, the Class of 92 ever again. That was just, you know, a proper, you know, one-off. Um, but, you know, there's so many other youngsters who maybe not have made it at United, but, you know, have gone on to have really good careers as well. But I think, you know, what Fergie brings is, you know, what we mentioned earlier, he's got that fear factor about him, you know, a bit like a headmaster. You know, kind of type. You 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 have you have to be hundred percent every day in training, and hundred percent every every time you go out and play. You know, his mentality is win the game. You know, win the game in an attacking way. Um, you know, don't 
don't duck out of tackles. You know, he, he would hate that if he if he if he uh, jumped out of tackles. Uh, he'd hate it if he wore molds. If he saw you with molds on, he'd go absolutely crazy. Um, he just had that fear factor about him. You know, he demanded so, so, so much high standards in training. You know, he brought the right coaches in to 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 do the first team. Obviously, Brian Kidd, Steve McLaren, etc., um, to take the sessions because he never. T- I mean, I was there three years. And he never took one actual training session. You know, Kiddo or, or Steve McClown would take every single session. He just used to come out, join in the Rondo boxes and then just watch. But, you know, he used to be quite quiet. But if it wasn't, you know, if training wasn't on, on, on point, he would he would go absolutely crazy. And he just had that, you know, um, you know, winning mentality. Um, never give up, you know, never die attitude. He was a born winner. And I think that, you know, shows with the players. But I think... You know, it's the players he, he's brought into the team as well at the time. Obviously, when I was there, they had Roy Keane, who was, you know, he's probably communicator in the change, changing rooms and on the pitch, uh, on the training grounds. And before me, it was probably Brian Robson and people like that. So, uh, you know, he's, he's a clever guy. He brings the right people in, the right, picks the right captains. And his record speaks for itself, doesn't it? You know, um, it, it, it's he, incredible. Um, was he different to each player's uh, needs, if you like? So, say, if you needed you know, an arm round you or if someone else needed a bit of a rollicking, like, yeah. was, was that obvious to yeah. everyone that he was? Yeah, 100%. Um, I think um, when Rooney's come out and said some Annie about him, uh, always taking, you know, rollickings off him because he could handle it and uh, yeah, yeah. Poor, poor Nanny, he weren't allowed to shout at Nanny because Nanny would <laughs> nearly cry or something. But yeah, you know, he knew, he knew who could bollock, you know, and who, who could take it like a man um, and he knew who he had to put his arm round and, you know, be nice to and stuff like that. And that, I think that's what makes him so great. Uh, you know, um, I mean, I was only there three years, um, but that's what I found, you know, that he, he was a, a really good man manager with the players, um, how to handle each player, you know. Um, you know, and, and at that time, there were some incredible characters, you know, mm. Schmeichel, Yapstam, you know, Ronnie Johnson, you know, Giggsy, Butty, who was a wild card as well, Keno, obviously. Um, and Keno was probably the main one because... He had such authority and he could he had, he had such a hold on the team. You know, I remember a couple of times training being being cancelled after five or ten minutes because Keno's gone mad at Fergie and they're, they're, they're effing and blinding at each other over a silly thing. I remember once we were having a rondo box and um Fergie had dropped a pass short and and Keno couldn't get to it and Fergie was told Keno to go into the middle of the box and Keno just went, Shut up, you all he says, uh, you're in, chuck the bibbit in. And it all just kicked off left and right back at each other. And then in the end, Ferguson, said, Ferguson just said, right, everybody in. And everyone was like, we've only been out training in five minutes. <laughs> he just said everybody in. He went, Keno in my office now. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, he just, he just, he, he was just incredible, really. And like you say, you know, his man management skills were, were second to none. But this also, John, it, all, it also spread on to uh, other managers as well, didn't it? You know, that Steve Bruce, uh, Mark Hughes, who you played under, Brian Robson, who you played under later on in your career, um, Gary Neville, um, that these kind of players, you know what I mean, became to be managers, but became and had a, and also had a, had a, had a calm and influence, you know what I mean? Because they've, they've, they've had that hairdryer treatment, they've, 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 they've seen the, the kind of training methods and the way that they are, you know what I mean? That, that arm around the shoulder and treating every player individually and differently. And I, and I think the traits, what you can learn from somebody like him is just, is just unbelievable, isn't it? And, and it doesn't surprise me that the amount of good managers which have come out from playing under him is just ridiculous, really. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head, mate. You're totally right. I think, um, you know, like me being a coach now, you try and take bits from all the old managers you've played with and all the old coaches you've had, you know, the good stuff and, and, and the bad stuff. And, yeah. you know, I try and take all, all the good stuff from, obviously, Ferguson and then, you know, um, because, you know, he's, he's a, a wonderful manager. But you try and think of the bad things and, the, and there's nothing really because, you know, we're, you know, he's got everything covered. You know, he ticks every box, really. Yeah. I think, um, you know... I think the biggest thing for, for me about him is he was just an absolute born winner. You know, I remember times at half time where, you know, it would be nil nil or one nil and we played really well and he'd, he'd go absolutely, you know, mental saying, lads, you're not impressing me, you're not attacking enough, you know, you need to, I don't care if you lose the game five nil, but if you don't start attacking and getting crosses and shots and taking players on, I'm going to drag you all off and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. Um, it's just um, he just knows how to handle every situation because you know he's been there and done it probably he'd been at manager you know numerous years he'd had a mm. successful playing career as well um, 
And uh, you know, you know, he just he just knew he just knew the game inside and out. You know, that's probably why he didn't have to take any coaching sessions. You know, he just yeah. When well, you, you you said it earlier about just having the right people around him, you know, I mean, he's done it for years, and he you know, Brian Kidd, unbelievable coach, Steve McLaren, unbelievable coach, went on to be a very good manager. Um, Carlos Quiros, you know, what I mean, unbelievable coach, went on to coach uh, coach Real Madrid national team. You know, what I mean, so he's he's always been really really clever and had the right people around him at the right time. You know, yeah. so it's Mike, success. Mike Feeling, Mike, Mike Feeling, yeah, he's always gonna. It's always gonna, it's always gonna follow, isn't it? But um, yeah. right, um, moving on. So obviously, the pinnacle. We said it earlier on. Pinnacle of anybody's career uh, has got to be Champions League and winning the Champions League. So tell us how. Um, obviously, the Champions League um, group stages obviously panned out. You know what I mean? Obviously, that that what I remember from that from that Champions League um, running. You know what I mean? It's a semi final against uh, Juventus, Juventus uh, yeah. with obviously the way the. The way the game went on, the way the way that uh, I think Yorkie and Cole just absolutely ran right in the end, and, and I think yeah. both scored, uh, both scored at least one. I think one of them scored two, and uh, obviously Ryan um, Paul must have got booked in the in That's one right, of the games yeah. to, to, game, to, to get to get banned uh, for the final. So obviously with the, with with those with those two getting a, getting a sending uh, getting a booking in the in the in the second leg, how, did you know straight away that you had an opportunity then to be involved in the final? I knew I had an opportunity, but um, there was still three or four weeks away, you know, from then. And uh, there was, you know, probably another six or seven reserve ga- games to play. You know, obviously, there was a few Premier League games to play and FA Cup, whatever. I can't really remember. But, yeah. you know, I knew I had to be uh, performing well in the reserves. And I remember playing, I think Teddy had been injured. And uh, about, ten, about 10 days before the Champions League final or a week before the last Premier League game when they, they beat Tottenham to win the Premier League, we had a reserve game and Teddy was having an outing. Me and Teddy played at front. I think he was against Oldham at Oldham. I think we both scored two, um, one four one or something like that. And I, I played really well. And I thought, oh, I've given myself a chance here to be to be yeah. involved in the Champions League final. You know, because th- there was probably two spaces left, one space left on the bench because Keno and Scholes were suspended. Yeah, yeah. It was probably out of me. I don't know if you remember Matt Wilson who came to Middlesbrough. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I remember. And John yeah. Curtis, do you remember John Curtis? Yeah, I know John. Yeah, I know John very well. So yeah. It was probably it was probably one space for one of us three. Mm. But you know, every day in training, I was thinking, right, I've got to be on it today. I need to keep in Ferguson's mind. Well, that was that was that was going to be that was going to be my next point. Did uh, did you see a visible um, change in the standards? You know, what I mean, with 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 obviously the FA Cup final against uh, was it Newcastle, which was yeah obviously Newcastle. a week or so, week or so before that. Obviously, you, you won that. So was it was the standard ramped up with all these big games coming thick and fast? Oh yeah, you know everyone wanted to be involved, and uh, obviously West Brown was involved as well. So uh, yeah. West West Brown was probably with me, Willow, and Kurt, and uh, yeah, training was you know pro- everyone was up for it. Like I say, I think me me playing well up front with Teddy um, in that reserve game probably about 10 days before uh, the Champions League final was a big help because I played really well and I was doing well in training. And I just remember it was obviously winning the Premier League on the Saturday, <laughs> which was crazy. Mm. Um, we had the best night out ever, party till 5, <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning. I was thinking, we've got FA Cup final next Saturday. <laughs> so the week later, training was class all week. The next Saturday, we'll win the FA Cup fi- win the FA Cup against Newcastle. We ended up yeah, having was- a massive party again. Well, There's only so Newcastle or John, I want it, so that's probably why you, <laughs> yeah, you, went, you, went, you went big. <laughs> yeah, we had a massive party again, and I'm thinking, I'm at the biggest club in the world, and we're just getting pissed all the time. This is mental. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, and after the FA Cup final, I was thinking, you know, we've got the Champions League game on Wednesday night. Surely we're not be able to have a drink. And everyone was just sozzled, you know, till five, six o'clock in the morning. And we ended up flying to Concord, by Concord on the Sunday to uh, Barcelona and then get, get involved for the Champions League final. And I just remember the morning of the game, no one knew the team, no one knew the, the, the uh, subs. And Ferguson at breakfast said to me, there was like a, a snooker table uh, near the foyer. He says, uh, you fancy a game of snooker? And I thought, that's a strange question. And I said, yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking, I'm not too bad to be fair, because I used to play at the Workingmen's Club, my old man and brothers all the time. I thought, I'll smash you up. He says, listen, if you beat me, <laughs> he says, you're on the bench tonight. He says, but if I be- beat you, you're not on the bench. So I was thinking, right, I've got you here. Anyway, he absolutely thrashed me. Like, thrashed me. <laughs> I didn't know he had his own snooker table and snooker room in his gaff. So... All afternoon, I'm like thinking, oh, I've blown it. I've absolutely blown it. He's absolutely spanked me. We get to the new camp. We go into the change room and my shirt's hanging up. And I was just, I just couldn't believe it. I, honestly, I was just like, oh, my God. Like, I was just, all of a sudden, all nerves came. I opened my locker and there was still a um, um, Spanish Cup medal in there and a, and a Liga medal from uh, whoever's locker it was. I think it was Figo's or something like that. 
still hanging up and I'm thinking, <laughs> what am I, what is he doing leaving his medals here? I could have had these. Too many of them. Uh, Got too many of them. And, uh, and then the, obviously the rest is history. I was on the bench and then the game panned out like it did and it was incredible because the actual game wasn't the best game in the world, but the last four minutes of the game, you know, That's when Teddy and Holly scored, was just... I don't think anybody will ever forget that moment in the Champions League. And I think as, I think as every British football fan, you know that everyone wanted that to happen. And you know what I mean? I, I don't care what people say. You know what I mean? Even rival football fans, you know what I mean? We all want teams to be successful. But that was just a, an unbelievable moment in British football. It was just so, so surreal. It must have been unbelievable to be to be part of that. And It was. It was just, it was just like you say, it was incredible. It was amazing. It was everything, you know, you say. Um, to say that like a year and a bit earlier, I was at York City, you know, when... Sometimes we used to train with jumpers because we didn't have any goals, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so to say, you know, I've gone from gone from there to to being part of a treble winning team with a, a club, you know, I supported as a kid and um, players who, you know, I used to watch on telly was was just amazing. And, um, you know, I'll never forget it. My friend sent me a clip actually a few weeks ago on a WhatsApp of like the celebrations after because... You know, back in them days, there was no, like, camera phones and stuff no. like that, was there? No. And, um, you know, it was all of us celebrating and on the pitch and stuff like that. And it's the first time I've ever seen it. And it was just, it was just mm. absolutely fantastic to see. Yeah, it brings it back, doesn't it? Uh, I'm going to quote you, if you don't mind, because uh, I found uh, a little quote what you said, or you might not have said, but you can tell me if you did. Uh, you said you felt like a bit of a fraud after winning the Champions League. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that was a few years after winning it, but I didn't, I don't, I didn't really mean it as it, as it, as it sounds, because... You know, you, people used to say, oh, you, you know, you're the only player who'd ever played any European football, you, you know, uh, to get a Champions League medal and stuff like that. It's a great pub question if you ever get it. Mm. Um, but then, you know, my mum and dad used to say to me all the time, he'd say, listen, you worked incredibly hard, you know, you, you know, you used to travel, to travel to every away game and be left out. You know, you'd go to all the home mm. games and get left out. You know, you'd come back at three, four o'clock in the morning from Champions League games, go and play a resi game, you know, giggling or wherever it is. Um, you train every day with the first team, you know, you did, you, you know, you worked your you, you nuts off to, to be there. Um, so when, when you put it into that perspective, I think, you know, I don't really see myself as a fraud anymore. Um, I, 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 I feel like I, I, I deserve I, to, I, deserve I totally to agree. Medal. And I, totally I think agree. I probably, totally I probably do deserve to probably, I mean, nowadays you get an FA Cup medal as well, don't you? And a, uh, and a Premier League medal nowadays, if you're in the squad, but, because I didn't make enough appearances in the Premier League, I didn't get um, a Premier League medal on FA Cup. But looking back, I probably deserved it because you know what it's like, Cammy. You know, as a young player, you you, trap, you you're still doing exactly every everything that the first team are doing, all the sessions, and, all the, and, the strength and work. more. You, and more and, because you, you know what I mean. Because you know you, you'll you know away games, for example, that you'll go to the away game. You know what I mean. You'll prepare. You'll train on the Friday. You'll travel on the Friday. You'll go to the game. You'll you'll eat. You'll sleep. You'll wake up. You go to the game. Uh, you're not involved, and then we had to do running after. So we, I probably worked hard after the game. You have a quick yeah. shower, you get on the bus. Uh, tomorrow you're in training again because you've got a, a reserve game on Monday, and it's just it, you, you don't get a day off. It's it's mentally and physically tiring more than anything. Yeah. It's exactly. um, and you know what I mean. For me, whatever whatever good comes of it, or whatever you know what I mean. For me, you've got to take the positives and you've got to enjoy it because, like I say, moments and the good moments, especially like that moment, you know, what I mean? it doesn't come around as, as as often as it should for people and. You know what I mean, and and you know what I mean. I um, people, I spoke to somebody about uh, Ross Turnbull. Ross Turnbull, a uh, good friend of mine. Um, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Won, as well. won, won the Champions League at Chelsea, and and people said the same thing to Ross. That you know what I mean. He, he was celebrating um, his Champions League win uh, in Munich uh, in some uh, jacuzzi on top of a hotel, and, pe and people slagging him off, saying he, he, he doesn't have a right. Well, hang on a minute. It's a it's a it's a twelve month season. You know what I mean, from pre season all the way through to the end of the season. It's a long, long time. He's probably done more miles than anybody else. He's he's turned up. He's sat there. He's been patient. He's letting off a bit of steam. He's enjoying the moment the same as anybody else is. And for for me, people just need to understand it's um, you know it's a squad game. It's a you know what I mean it's not just about eleven players, twelve players, thirteen players. It's about twenty five players sometimes. You know what I mean? To, yeah. To get, and you, to and get it's not the, yeah. yeah. And it's not the, it's not the player. It's not the like the players in the Chelsea team will all love Ross. You know what I mean? And yeah. all be buzzing from him. It's just the people from outside totally. the club. And it's the same with me. The players at United were absolutely brilliant with me. You know? That's just jealousy. You know, jealousy. That's all yeah, it is. We, we absolutely so simple. You know, had a great time. Mm. Well, I think this moves us on side, doesn't it? To uh, to project restart. Nicely. Yeah. Yeah. So really, like. What we like to do, John, is we just sort of cover what's going on, a couple of stories just about in the football world, really. Obviously, Project Restart is about to uh, begin. Um, 
I wonder, I, before we get like into the nuts and bolts of it, I am interested in what you think about football coming back, whether it should be coming back. Is it the right thing to do? Like, I've got a big thing. I think FIFA should have stepped in months ago for everybody. And then you wouldn't be having the problems where you've got hearts in Scotland threatening legal action and potential, you know, that could happen in other leagues. You've got, I think, League Two has finished. League One is doing playoffs. Championships playing. Premier League's playing. It's really a bit of a shambles, in my opinion. But I I am more interested in kind of your view on it and what you think as an ex-player than myself. Yeah, I agree with you uh, about FIFA. I think you, you're totally right on that aspect. You know, FIFA should have probably stepped in, you know, you know, probably the first week or two week of lockdown when it was getting really serious. And I totally agree with, agree with you with that because it could have sol- solved a lot of problems. But because they haven't, I think it's just, like you say, a little bit of a shambles here, there and everywhere. Different leagues having different things. You know, obviously, York are having the, you know, uh, the problems at the moment. York City, you know, uh, being top of the league. But, they're going on the points per game system. So at the moment, they're not being promoted. They're taking it to the, the government to try and help them get two promoted instead of one. Um, like you say, League One, League Two, different championships, different to National League, whatever. And then you've got the Premier League as well. For me, I think, um, you know, I'm a big believer that everybody wants to see football back on the screens. I'm sure you two guys agree, you know, because without it, there's something missing, um, you know. I mentioned earlier, I watch most games on football from the Premier League all the way down, La Liga, Champions League games and stuff like that. And uh, for me, we need to get football back on back on the screens. But like we said, like, you know, everyone's been saying, it has to be safe for everybody. And that's not just the players. People just think of the players, but you've got to think of the coaching staff, the management, you know, um, the people who are going to the games, the referees, the assistants, the, the TV crews, um, the policemen, policewomen ambulance drivers, whatever it is, everybody has to be safe because, you know, what God forbid, you know, we start playing Premier League games and people, a footballer or somebody who's part of getting the games back on TV gets COVID and dies, then, you know, we're going to have a real problem on our hands. Oh, yeah. Well, we said the same thing, John. So we, um, I don't know if you listen to talk sports. So um, obviously my hero in life is uh, Simon Jordan. You know what I mean? I, 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 every, ta- <laughs> every time, he co- every, every time he opens his mouth, I just adore, I, and you, Si. Um, I just think he just talks so much sense, and he said the same thing. So he said um, that it's a lawsuit waiting to happen, starting football oh, again. He oh, said, yeah. uh, he said um, the criminal, the criminal law system will will absolutely eat a football club up if something like what you just said happens. And and you know what I mean. And f- forget forget that for a little bit. It's it's going to be su- it would be such a uh, such a shame and such heartbreak for for family, for the clubs, for for football in, in, in general and, ho- and hopefully it doesn't happen because it's just a game you know what I mean it, it, let's, let's be honest it's just a game a game that we all love and a game that we all want back of course we do but it is just a game and um, you know what I mean we, we, we've we've talked about it till we're blue in the face I haven't we we've had, we've had individual shows on it uh, we spoke about it things keep happening um, that Spurs played Norwich um, through the week um, one of the Norwich players um, I saw that. Has, has got been contracted with, with, with COVID-19 and 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 because it was outside, and because no player got two meters close to him for longer than fifteen minutes, which I don't get because how, how anyone can measure that is just yeah. beyond me. But you know, what I mean? you can't it's measure just, it, can you? No. Well, it's impossible unless somebody yeah. watches the game yeah. and 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 times each player how, how close they are. It's just it's it's ridiculous. You know what I mean? And you just they, they all just need That's testing straight away. And if if they get tested negative, then yes, they can carry, for me they can carry on. And that's the only I, safe way of doing it. I think the positive. Yeah, I think the positive thing you can say from it is, you know, you look at Germany's league's been back, what, two two or three weeks now? Yeah. And uh, it seems to be running quite smoothly. There's not been any, you know, um, yeah. COVID-19 uh, incidents or anything like that. So hopefully, fingers crossed, I mean, you know, we all want everyone to be healthy, you know, and, um, you know, not get ill or, you know, God forbid, die. Um, we can get the football back on the screens because, you know, there's not just... The problem of COVID, you've got people as well, you know, um, who were suffering from depression and, you know, all kinds of stuff, um, you know, in the day to day lives, you know, being in lockdown, you know, um, abusive relationships, whatever it may be, you know, that need to have a little bit of joy back in their lives. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's got to be carefully thought out. Hopefully it's been carefully thought out and hopefully we can mm. get back the football on the TV so people can enjoy it again. But then make sure it's safe for everybody. And, and like I said, that just doesn't include the players. I totally agree. So before we uh, move on to uh, back onto your career, um, 
Uh, I lost my trail of thought there. Um, I lost my trail of thought. Um, no, it was um, it was about. Um, I've lost my trail of thought. All right. Well, I've got a, uh, I've got a quick yeah, question go if you want me to. I'll get it back. Um, Johnny just said in the chat there, uh, John, that he said if Pogba, for instance, gets uh, seriously ill, um, that could potentially cost the Premier League, Man United, you know, millions, maybe even more than, you know, you could be talking billions because he's on the brink, if you believe the papers, that he's probably going to leave for Real Madrid. But even if you take out the move and, and the mon monetary side of it, if any of these players have expressed uh, a concern or they've said, look, I don't really want to play, and the clubs have kind of said, no, you, you know, you're contracted to us, the Premier League's starting, you have to play. It's came back to me now. In the nicest possible way. It's came back to me. Lyle Taylor, it's the same thing, yeah, Lyle Taylor. Really cool. So Lyle Taylor, your point. So into the same thing, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so thoughts on that then, John, you know what I mean? I, see, I, my, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll well, my, I've been quite uh, opinionated over the last couple of weeks on it. He should, he should play, but he should play for the rest of this month, and that, and that's, and that's, and anything after that's a bonus for Charlton Athletic Football Club. You know what I mean? I feel really sorry for Lee Boyer. You know what I mean? I think he's done an absolutely amazing job. We cover the championship on this show, um, and for me, he's, he's yes, they're down the bottom of the league, but for me, he's up there with being one of the managers of the year because of the job he's done. He's done an amazing job. He's 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 spent no money. They've been a a shambles of a club, you know what I mean? And he's he's, he's picked some unbelievable results up. He's he's got some hidden gems, including Lyle. And I think he's been let down let down by that player and two others, by the way. But but he's the most high profile one. I I, I agree with you as well, Cammy. I think you know uh, Lyle's. If if I was Lyle, I would play till the end of my contract, which is like you say, the end, end of uh, end three of June. three games. I think it's three games he should play. Yeah, that, that's that's it. I can understand. I've, I've listened to his opinions when it's come out on, on TV and, and said the reasons why. You know, he's, he's been released a couple of times when he's younger. You know, he's probably not made the money he probably thought he could make. He thinks he, he's going to get one last big move. If he plays one of these games and he get, breaks his leg or he does his cruise shit or something like that, then he, he's not going to get paid for a year. I totally get that. But for me, as a footballer, you've got a responsibility to the club you're playing for. You've got responsibility to the fans. And most of all, you've got responsibility to yourself. Because, you know, you've got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, I'm getting paid whatever he's on. Say, I don't know, whatever he's on. I'm getting paid to play for Charlton Football Club. There's still three games left. I can play until the end of June. Yeah. Play the three games. Do what you're paid to do. Don't disappoint the, spa the fans. Don't, don't let yourself down. And, you know, if he did play them three games, he probably won't get half the stick he's getting at the moment. Because, you yeah. know, uh, at the moment he's getting pelters. Uh, is it right to give him pelters? So I'll yeah. play. Um, I'll play the the like the uh, the other side of the coin then. Okay. So Lyle Taylor could have conceivably come out and said, "I don't want to play because of concerns over COVID nineteen." Yeah. Um, you know X, Y, and Z. He could have done that, but he was honest. He come out and he said, "Look, my contract's up. I've got a big mm. move lined up. I'm." making myself unavailable. Now, I'm not saying that he sh I agree he should play and he should do that, but he should do it because that's the right thing to do. I don't mm. feel like he should be like told that he has to do it. He should do it because he wants to. But but, but Troy Deeney, though, Troy, Troy, Troy Deeney said that, though, and got, and got pelters. So it's, yeah. you, you know what I mean? So maybe he's looked at different situations and thought, you know what I mean? Do, do I say that and, and get... And get pelters, or do I say this? And maybe he's not, but then it's but then he's getting hammered again. So you know, I don't think there's any any right way or wrong way. I think every individual is is so different in it. You know what I mean? I know uh, we had Stewie Downing on the show. Um, Stewie's out of contract. We spoke we spoke to Stewie about uh, is he going to play um, with being out of contract, and he said he's trying to thrash out a, a, a short term deal with Blackburn, but then he's looking to stay beyond that for another another season or two. So you know what I mean? So he's his circumstances are a little bit different, but he said that even if he was just um, not going to get a new contract, he said he would have played because he said he owes it to the fans, the players, his teammates himself. I think with Stewie, with Stewie obviously I play with Stewie, he's an absolute top player, you know, yeah. unbelievable ability. With Stewie, maybe it's a little bit different to Lyle, just in respect of Stewie's Edge. probably earned a lot, a lot of money. You know? Edge as well, yeah. He's had some unbelievable moves, he's been on big, big money for a lot of years where Lyle's probably yeah. not had that. So he's probably thinking about the other side of it is you know, can he get a little bit of money to survive, you know, after football kind of thing. Yeah. My question would be is when he came out with, with, with saying he wasn't going to play until the end of June because, of, you know, he's going to go on a free, 
Have Charlton said they're not going to pay him the whole of June? Because surely um, Charlton did say, well, we're not going to pay you for June. Yeah, well, uh, uh, the, because he's, the, he's the, refusing to play. Yeah, he's, he's breached the contract, isn't it? You know what I mean? People have said, don't pay him. And I think Lee Boyer did an interview on Talk Sport and said, uh, and said, listen, he said that the, the sign on fee he's going to get from. I've heard it from Glasgow Rangers. Um, okay. I said to you, Zen, for just an example, you know what I mean? They said the sign-on fee he's going to get from his new club uh, he's going to exceed any any wages that he's going to lose. His, his, his new contract's going to be bumper four times the amount he's getting the Charlton Athletics. So, you know what I mean? I, I don't think money's... I don't think money's the object as in short-term money. I think he's, he's looking after himself long-term, which I, yeah. I can't fault any player do. I just yeah. think he owes it. He, he just owes the next three games, you know what I mean? And, I, and I'd hope he wouldn't get injured. And I'd yeah. hope his new club, if he did get injured in those three games... Stood by him, stood yeah. by him, looked after him because that, that, yeah. that's you know, for me. But, but Cammy, you know the wooden, that's the thing. No, I know the wooden, that's, and that's, agree, and that's, I, the, I that's agree, the shame. I, I agree with that extent. I think, you know, if he's got his move sorted to Rangers, fair enough. If I was in that same position and I'd got and I had the end of the, uh, three games in June to play and I'd already agreed to go to Rangers, for instance, I would pay, I would play the three games. Mm. Um, because I'd have to do it because I wouldn't be able to look myself in the mirror. But that's yeah, just the same. difference probably between me and him. But then yeah, I get the other side of it because clubs, you know, clubs, you know, you, we all talk about players taking the mickey out of the clubs, but clubs take the mickey out of players all the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. If, you're not, if, you're, if you're not wanted at the club, they'll soon get you out. They'll find a way of getting you out and not paying you all your money and stuff like that. So I get that side of it as well. We could argue about it all day, really. But yeah, yeah. for me, if it was me... I would play the last three games till the end of my contract, then I'd go and sign for Rangers. That's what I would do. Uh, well, I think this... Go on. Sorry to on. I just want to ask both of you this, really, as, um, as ex-players. With a pre-contract, has he signed to say, like he's signed for Rangers, for instance, if, it's, if it is Rangers, or has he basically like a, a handshake deal to say, I will join when my contract's up? Because if it's not signed, sealed and delivered contractually, couldn't Rangers decide that maybe they don't want someone who's going to refuse to play or have a bad I, attitude? I, I imagine they've probably told him not to play. But I think, yeah. Uh, well, I think, I think, I think that the pre-contract is there to protect both parties. Right. You know what I mean? So, so um, if he does get injured, for example, then Rangers have an obligation or an opportunity to pull out. You know what I mean? And likewise, Lyle has an opportunity to not sign that contract. But he signed a pre-contract agreement where he signs a brand new contract on July the first. Mm. Which is a three, four, five, whatever, whatever your contract that may be. You know what I mean? So it's just put in place, uh, just so nobody else can snaffle him up. And you know what I mean? They've got first refusal on him. Yeah, that's okay. So, so Rangers or whoever could could pull out if if, if he got in if like, if he got injured. So you know what I mean? It, listen, if whoever it is, and and I'm, I am hearing it's quite strong a strong possibility it is Rangers. You know what I mean? That that the manager potentially will have been on the phone saying, "Listen, I don't want you to get injured." You know what I mean? Is there a, is there a chance that you that you cannot play? You know what I mean, and he's probably then gone. Oh, do you know what? I'll 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 say it, and do you know what I mean. He's took the backlash, but you know what I mean. If he's if he's going to a new club, it'll be all news in um in what 15, 16 days time because his contract will have gone. He'll have moved somewhere else. He'll have gone to another team, and you know what I mean. The, the, but the, I, I I just hope part of me hopes that that Charlton don't get punished for this and and they can stay yeah, up. But then but then it has a but then it has an effect on Middlesbrough because Middlesbrough are fighting with Charlton to stay up. So. I should be, I should be here saying, listen, Lyle, don't play, can't stand it. Yeah, but I, I'm, it's more integrity for me. It's more that you know what I mean. That, it's a, it's a difficult one, and I can see it from everywhere. Definitely but difficult. Yeah. I, I think it, for me, he should play three games and then just and then move and shake everyone's hand. Fans will love him. Players will love him. His teammates, his is himself. He'll, 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 he'll have done it right. Um, okay, so just before we go back to Jono's career, I'm going to just go through some of the questions we've had in the live chat because we've had quite a few. Uh, I've been saving them up. So uh, let's have a look. Uh, okay. Uh, who's the best player you've ever played with, uh, Jono? Easy for me, that one. Paul Scholes, the best player I've played with and against. Absolutely unbelievable, honestly. I mean, Ryan Giggs is up there for me, but Paul Scholes just had everything. You know, um, for somebody who was quite small, probably five foot seven, you know, probably not the fittest guy in the world, never did any strength conditioning or anything like that. Um, but his mind was about 10 seconds quicker than anybody else. You know, you, you know, his range of passing, left to right, right to left, short passes, diagonals, pings. He could score a goal. You know, um, he could dictate the pace of the game, speed it up, slow it down. Um, the guy who I played with, was he was just unbelievable. And then to play against him, 
you know, uh, you couldn't get the ball off him. You know, you've got to try and close yeah. him down. He'd, he'd flick it around the corner and get a little one-two. He'd stick it through your legs and ping it out to Bex or whatever. Um, and if you give him space and time, you know, he threw balls, switches a player. You know, he was just incredible. And, you know, he, he, you know, he, used to, he couldn't even do the bleep test. He used to fall, drop out just after the keepers. You know, he wasn't, you know, but he could, he's just, a, so, his mind was so sharp. He was just unbelievable, honestly, world-class. Does he get the credit he deserves, or John? Because probably you know what I mean? not. When, when, when people say the best midfielder of, the, of his generation, golden generation, it's always Lampard and Gerrard for me. Yeah, you know, yeah. what I mean, I mean that's, that, you know, not for me personally, but that, that's what that's. It's always them too, and it's never. Listen, Paul never seems to get a mention. Listen, Cammy, we could argue about it all day. You played mm. against him. I played against. I mm. played well. You, me, and you have both played with Lampard and Stevie G uh, mm. for England twenty ones. I mean, I played against all them midfielders: Scalzi, uh, Keno, Patrick Vieira. You know, Frank Lampard, Gerrard, um, who else is there? I mean, there's loads. Paul Lynch, you know, who obviously loads, played yeah. for those, but I mean, there's loads. Deco, Xavi I played against, Perlo. I mean, for me, the, the person I found it hard to play against was Paul Scott. I played with him and he couldn't get the ball off him. He was like, yeah. just running the show at United. But then I played against him and he ran the show. You know what I mean? He was just incredible. And I think, you know, people talk about Lampard, Gerrard and all that. Yeah, listen, the world-class players, they're unbelievable. Frank Lampard scored like, was it 20 Premier League goals a year for about 10 years mm. in the spin? Incredible. Gerard yeah. scored all the goals, was, was mm. Liverpool's uh, captain and, you know, scored some incredible goals. But for me, for his, you know, longevity, you know, he went, he retired, didn't he? Then 18 yeah. months later, came out of retirement, played half a season and won the league again. So I, remember his, I remember his first game back, he played in Manchester yeah. Derby Man and City, ran, the, yeah. ran, the game, ran the game with no boots. He got, he got, exactly. got a pair of boots. So, good. so for me, just, Cream because, rises, I, Cream just rises. because I played with him and played against him, so I know what he's like as well, yeah. um, you know, and play and played against all the other players for eight, ten, twelve years, whatever it is. Um, for me, it has to be Paul Scholes because he, you yeah. know, he, he's the hardest player I played against. Do you reckon that that's? Um, I don't want to maybe say the term embarrassing is perhaps a bit harsh, but do you think it's a shame that he wasn't able to do more? At at England, you know, international level, because he was so, you know one of the best midfielders in the world, if not ever, and he didn't really get the chance to show that on the international stage. And it feels like England maybe missed out on that. I think you know there was there was all them problems back in the day, weren't there? When you had Stevie G, Frank Lampard, and Scholes, and the manager kept playing Scholes on the left of the midfield yeah. for because you know uh, he said Lampard or um, Gerard couldn't play on the left and. You know, it probably hindered him a little bit, and that's probably one of the reasons why you know he retired when he did. But I still think his record for England's quite good. His yeah. goal scoring record is is quite incredible mm. as well. I, I think it's probably... unfair as well. I think it's unfair, John or me. I think it's unfair that um, that, that he gets he gets tired of that brush a little bit. And same as Jamie Carragher, people retire for the reasons because club football became more important. You know that that that. that People are playing out of position for country, you know what I mean? Like you just said there, out of the three of them, one of them was playing on the left. You know what I mean? David Beckham was always on the right. You know what I mean? They only played two in the middle, so one of them had to go out on the left. Uh, if that was Scholes, if that was Stevie G. You know what I mean? Frank never really went out there. Um, so it was. it's a little bit unfair, you know? They were, they were filling filling holes with wrong shapes, you know? It's, it's think just... That's down to the coaches to find, you know, you find a way to get Paul Scholes in his position because he is so good. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 but, well, yeah, I, yeah. Well, I think football's evolved, doesn't it? And I think formations evolved a little bit. That you play three of them, or you play two of them, and one of them, one of them above, or one of them behind. I think it works a treat. But I think football back then, it was a lot four four two. It was different yeah, formations, really different it. systems. Where now football's evolved a little bit. Yeah. Foreign coaches and football's changed. And I think it would suit those three now to play yeah. than it did when they played. I think yeah, you're totally right, Cammy. I think I think. Um, if you played now and you played the 4 3 3, what a lot of teams are playing, you play Scholes toward the midfield, wouldn't you? With Gerard on the right of the three and Lampard yeah. on the left, then you'd play mm. three up front. Yeah. Imagine Scholes dictating play with Ramon uh, Lampard and Gerard bombing pass, off. Passing ball. It would be unbelievable. Uh, that would be a dream, you know, and, and, I, and I think it was, it was people weren't brave enough to do it. And I think, you know what I mean? People can, people can pick out and say that those three couldn't play together. But then you had David Beckham thrown in it as well, you know what I mean? And Bex was Bex and yeah. his delivery, he had to play, you know what I mean? His yeah. crossing ability, his free kicks, his corners, his goal scoring ability, his performance in big games, his never say die attitude, the link he had with Gary Neville, that, yeah. you know what I mean? Then already you, you fight the losing battle because you, you're lopsided, your formation just doesn't work because you, you've got nothing down the left hand side. Ashley calls 
uh, playing on his own a little bit because you've got three tight and one, and, and it's just it just didn't work. And you know, I mean, John had just hit, hit the nail on it there, and it, it would have taken a brave manager to um, to to pick that kind of formation at the time because yeah. you know what I mean. So, we just we just didn't have we probably didn't have the three centre forwards the way that that you want to play yeah. as well. So it was yeah, nowadays, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. he played in pairs. It was Shearer and Sheringham played yeah, up front yeah. as a pair. So it's yeah, you're right. You know what I mean? It's um, anyway. Stop having to go to England. Yeah, uh, well, I, I find it hard. <laughs> let's talk, but let's talk about Liverpool instead. No, um, so I just I just spotted this question in the YouTube chat, which I find it's quite a fascinating question. Which I, you know, it's not something I would have necessarily thought of. So Gaz asked, um, "Is it worrying when you travel like in Europe to Euro, you know, Europa League, Champions League, whatever, um, and you're leaving your family behind?" with so many footballers have been targeted with burglaries and home invasions and stuff over the years? Um, I mean, I mean, I never really thought about it like that. I mean, um, I don't have a massive house like uh, all the uh, superstars anyway, so uh, no one will probably, probably rob me. But uh, yeah. I think, um, you know, as a, as a player, you're so used to travelling from a young age, you know, 16, 17 years of age, you know, away games, staying overnight a couple of nights uh, and stuff like that, that you just get used to it. And then, you know, obviously when you get, you know, married or have a girlfriend and, and have kids, you know, um, obviously you're just like a normal father or a normal husband or partner, you just try and protect you, your family and uh, you don't actually think about it when you're away from home, you know, you're always phoning and texting to see everything's okay and stuff like that. But I think, you you know, you get so used to it, you sort of like in your own little bubble, you know, you know, from like probably mid-summer for your whole season, you know, your away games, your home games and stuff like that. And, you know, sometimes if you, if, if you've moved away from home, you like my partner used to go back with the kids to where she's from, you know, and stuff like that for the weekend. So I knew she was safe anyway. So um, it wasn't too much trouble for me at all. Okay. So I, like, I, I do find it quite fascinating. Like I think these days, um, some of those young players have got to be, it's got to be on their minds um, just by, you know, it's happened recently. I think was it Delhi Ali? Uh, yeah. Had some sort of issue with it. Um, okay. Just before we move on, cause I know um, Andy, you wanted to talk about Matty Fryatt, but just before we go on to that, uh, Richie asks, uh, can you ask Jonathan, did Sir Alex have an influence on Ryan Giggs not making many appearances for Wales? Well, I can only say uh, my opinion of when I was there for them three years, so 19, 1998 to 2001. And, you know, um, Giggsy was obviously, you know, uh, United's biggest star, obviously Wales' biggest star as well. And for me, every time he was called up, um, he used to go when I was there, unless he was injured or if he had a knock. Uh, there was never, ever any talk from Sir Alex Ferguson saying, you know, you need to pull out of the squad yeah. because we've got an important game or stuff like that. I mean, there might have been behind closed doors just between him and um, Alex Ferguson, but there was nothing on the training ground where we heard anything like that. And, uh, you know, if he was carrying a knock, he was usually in the physio room with the treatment, so he was probably injured. So, I mean, I can only speak from my personal opinion um, of being there for them three years, and I never saw anything like that. Okay, yeah, fair enough. So all you can do is talk about what you were, what you experienced. By then, and tell me about uh, Matty Fryatt because I'm not yeah, Matty Fryatt. Do you know what it came? Um, it came quite out of the blue, John. I don't know if you've read anything about it, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he retired uh, Nottingham Forest through injury, uh, and now he's came out and he's and he's suing the club for uh, neglect. Um, through his, his rehabilitation and um, blaming Nottingham Forest, um, obviously one of your ex-clubs, um, that saying that he didn't, they didn't do enough to get him back fit. They didn't do enough um, rehabilitation and treatment in order to, um, to make him better and, and, and bring, him, bring him back to health and fitness-wise. And I just, think, I just think we're opening the kind of worms here. You know what I mean? Because um, unfortunately, you know what I mean? But the way you can, you can build up all you want. Injuries are part of football, you know what I mean? And it's, it's the worst part of football, you know what I mean? You go into yeah. a game, it could be your last game. You go into a training session, it could be your last training session. You could, you could break bones, you can do your cruise shirt, you know what I mean? You, but you can't go into those games and training sessions thinking like that. You say you go in there and if it happens, it happens. And, and sometimes, unfortunately, um, you know what I mean? You just, you just got to get on with it. And to then blame a club, um, to say that they haven't they haven't looked after you or they haven't done this and the under I don't know the ins and outs but I'm guessing a top football club like that have done their best to get one of their main assets which he will have been by the way back yeah. to health and back to fitness as quick as they could but unfortunately sometimes your body doesn't respond the way it should so he's had to retire and then sometimes people take it different ways I had to retire through injury I certainly didn't blame the football club it was just one of those things it's it's a it's a 
it's a hurdle in life where you've got to get over uh, and get over yeah. very quickly because no, oh, yeah. uh, and it's just one of those things, yeah. But you know, I mean, for me, I, I think he just needs to um, have a little think and 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 understand what the bigger impl- implications could be for other players, yeah. not just what he's doing himself. I think I've read the story, and uh, what I gather from this situation is that you know um, he had a bad Achilles, and you know he's trying to play through the pain. They were injecting him before games and half time and after and stuff like that, and to play through the pain. And then obviously it went it went quite badly, and he needed an op. And then the rehab wasn't as good. All I can say on that story is one, he was a top player. By the way, he was a good striker. You know, yeah, he was excellent. Yeah, good times. He was a good player. Mm. Two. You know, Nottingham Forest was my my uh, my last club, 2000 to 2014. Uh, my first year there, when I was 32 and a half, something like that, um, I broke my ankle. Uh, so I broke my ankle. I needed um, a rod and nine screws in it. And um, all I can say from my point of view is Nottingham Forest were absolutely brilliant with me. You know, they sent me to the specialists. They, they sorted the operation out. Um Afterwards, you know, they took me to the hospital. They took me home from the hospital. Afterwards, you know, there was care for three or four weeks. And then, obviously, you start the rehab, like you know, Cammy. Um, two, three sessions a day when you're injured. It's the worst thing in the world for any footballer. You know, mm. I was quite lucky because I was 32 and a half when I got, you know, a quite serious injury. Before that, you know, I'd have the double hernias, you know, a stress fracture of the foot and stuff like that, five broken noses. <laughs> um, but other than that, you know, I was quite lucky that I got that injury so late on. But... Forest were absolutely brilliant with me. It took me six months to get back fit. Um, I ended up going alone to Barnsley for a month to get match fit again. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, um, you know, because I was so old that you know it took me that long to get back. But they just took the time with me. They didn't rush me back. You know, um, the, the staff, the physio, the 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 the, the, the under physios, because there's you know there's a head physio and all the under physios were all absolutely fantastic with me for the six months I was injured to help me get back. Like. But I don't know if they were still there when 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 Matty went there after me. But all I can say was when I was there, the the, the whole staff were first class with me. Absolutely mm. brilliant. Really helped me with a real bad injury. I think as well, John. Me and you could both do our crutches tomorrow uh, at the same club at the same time. You, we could have the operation by the same surgeon on the same day. And we could respond differently to it. You know what I mean? You could be back in nine months. I could not respond at all. And I could have to retire. You just, it's just, unfortunately, yeah. it's just one of those things. And you know what I mean? I, I do feel sorry for him because it's, there's nothing, there's nothing worse than the day that you retire from football. There's nothing worse. You know what I mean? Listen, listen, listen when I, when I read the story, I actually felt really sorry for him because like you mm, said, I did, it's yeah. the worst. Like, you know, for me, I finished at 35 and a half. You know, I was, I was delighted to get to 35 and a half. You know, I didn't think I'd get past 30. But I was so happy to play the game for nearly 20 years mm. that, you know, I was absolutely delighted. But then I was still absolutely mortified that I'd finished my career. You know, I was absolutely devastated. I still am devastated six years on. Yeah. You know, I, I still have days where I'm absolutely gutted that I can't play football anymore because I miss mm. it so bad. So for him to get injured at 28, 29, you know, I can totally understand where he's coming from. He'll be so deflated, he'll be upset. He'll, mm. You know, he'll be thinking he's got another six, seven years playing the game he loves. And I really feel for him. I honestly really feel for him because, like I say, you know, I mean, played nearly 20 years and I played three years semi-pro as well. So, I mean, and I still get absolutely gutted about it. Nothing gets you ready for packing in football, you know. So, you know what I mean? If, and even when you're injured, you're always, you always get told, you know what I mean? The time scale, you always think that you're going to come out of it. You always think that, you know what I mean? You're yeah. going to come back stronger, fitter, stronger. Everyone tells you. But then sometimes, unfortunately, you know what I mean? I've been through it. You've, you've retired, you know what I mean? Other people... It's not nice, and it's you know what I mean. It's one of those things that I wish there was a, a magic formula that that, that there was yeah. a, a a better way of transition, or there was a, a better way of um, finding out that you're not going to play football again. And there was a there was like a, a little club where you could go and have a bit of banter with with the lads who've, who've yeah. been the same. But unfortunately, you know what I mean. Life's life. You just got to get on with it. It's it's tough. It's mentally harder than anything. And I think in lockdown, sometimes you you start to reminisce. You know what I mean. You start to think about. Um, different things certain things and it's it's not nice and you know what i mean these kind of things sometimes they, they make you stronger but also it, it can it can eat you up inside as well things like awesome. this you know what i mean and i hope i hope for a fact and i hope i really hope that he's he's mentally strong he's got the right people behind him and around him and and hopefully sense prevails and and he doesn't continue with this um this court case or whatever he's going through i just think it, i just think i hope he's getting the right advice from the right people who care about him personally not just caring about the payout at the end yeah i hope he's getting the right advice from the right people because sometimes it's easy for someone to say to Matty Fryer that, 
oh, listen, we can sue him for this amount of money because all they're thinking about is the money at the end of the day. Say if he gets a £2 million payout, they might get whatever, 500 grand or whatever. They're not really thinking about him, about his mental health or, you know, being so devastated of finishing his career through through an injury. So I just hope he's getting the right advice from the people who's in charge of him. Yeah. Um, right, moving back on to... Uh... Obviously, your successful career. So, um, an area, an area, well, a time in your life and my life, which we crossed paths. Obviously, you came and uh, and joined the mighty Middlesbrough. Um, obviously, Steve came in. Um, Brian Robson left um, left his job. Steve came in, and obviously, you you joined uh, along with Mark Wilson. So, tell us how the how the move came around. Uh, yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, so back in 2001, I was going back training with um, United, and um, obviously, Steve McLaren had just joined. Uh, Middlesbrough uh, as manager and um, I got a text off Steve just saying listen you know I uh, loved uh, coaching you for the last two years um, I think you've got loads of potential I, I want to know if you fancy coming to Middlesbrough and you know trying to play in week in week out because you know I think you need to look look for a first team club where you're going to play week in week out kind of thing and that's like what I mentioned to you earlier that's when I went to see Alex Ferguson and say listen you know which was hard to do, by the way. It's not hard. It's hard no, knocking no. on his door and asking, yeah, asking I can to imagine. leave. So it took me about 10 attempts to knock on his door, but eventually, you know, uh, put the courage up to knock on his door and just say, listen, you know, um, I got the opportunity to go to Middlesbrough with Steve. I think he'd probably already heard anyway. Um, I think it'd be good for me to, to go and start, hopefully play a week in, week out kind of thing. You know, you just you just bought Van Nistelrooy for 20 million, bought Veron for 34 million. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to play here. He just said, listen, um, John, uh, he used to call me son. Son, there's a four year contract for you there. I don't want you to go anywhere. So I walked out of the office thinking, oh, looks like I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, a couple of days later, I went to see him again. I spoke to mum and dad and said, listen, I spoke to Steve as well, and he really wanted me to go. And I, I just said to Alex, I said, listen, I, don't, I, really, I really need to go and start playing. I've only played 34 games for you over three years. You know, you've bought, bought all these players in. Um, basically, please let me go. And eventually um, he let me go, but I didn't know I was going with Willow at the time. And then obviously the d- deal happened. I think it was four million me or five million or something for me and Matt Wilson to go. And then it was it was one of the best things that ever ever happened. Absolutely loved it. Fantastic club, great owner, unbelievable fans. You know, great stadium, training ground was fantastic. And mm. the players, you know, like you and everybody else who obviously I played with you at twenty ones, you know, were so welcoming. You know, Robbie Stockdale, all, all the older players. You know, Gal Southgate had just signed. You know, you go Echo, you know, God bless him. Uh was there, he was class lad, Dean Windass, Mark Crosley, top lad, you know, Alan Botch, yeah. you know, there were so many great players and like you know, like I mentioned to you earlier about United players, the Middlesbrough players were just the same, absolutely top, top class lads, you know, absolute brilliant people. Um so then I asked you this question earlier then. So then um about United, did you feel like a proper first team player then? So is this the first time in your career then you felt like a proper first team regular player? Because obviously no, transfer say, fee, transfer fee was a bit a big a big yeah, one. Yeah, I think the transfer fee was obviously a bit bigger. I needed to get you know at that age at twenty two, you want to start playing week in week out, don't you? Like you know. So, what, and, so uh, let's let's put this to bed then, John. Was it was it four point nine million for you and one hundred grand for uh, Matt Wilson? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. The official, I don't know the but uh, Willow was top lad. He was really unfortunate with injuries. Actually, yeah, he, he was. Snapped yeah, his yeah, thigh, good. snapped his hamstring, good, snapped his Achilles. Good he had lad, some yeah. really bad injuries, and like you know, like. Like we mentioned earlier, we might fight. You've got to be so lucky with injuries. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to be in the right place at the right time. You've got to be lucky with injuries. But, you know, I went to Middlesbrough. I think, you know, um, Inti was there as well. You know, he was a brilliant guy to have around. You know, there's so much fun in the change room. And I settled in really quick. And, you know, I started playing week in, week out. And Steve promised me he'd start playing me. And I did. And I probably wasn't... My first season, probably, you know, I wouldn't say I was at my best. You know, the odd game I played well. But, I was, you know, I was still learning my trade as a young kid. But, um and then, obviously, the second season, I thought I played really well. You know, I, I got into the England squad once and, you know, I got a few player of the years and I was playing really well. And, you know, I was absolutely loving my time there. And, um, you know, like I said to you earlier, great fans, great stadium to play at. We were doing really well. I think we finished 11th and 12th the first two seasons I was there yeah. or something like that. Uh, yeah, well, was... cup, cup runs as well. So, And then, obviously, mm. my third season was a bit disappointed because I had a couple of slight injuries. I had, I had to have my tonsils out as well. And then, you know, I played a few, I played the first leg and I played every round of the Cardin Cup and then I played the first leg against Arsenal and then I tore my thigh. Well, I didn't know I tore my thigh, I played the whole game and then after the game I tore my thigh so I, I missed the sem- second leg. And um, obviously, um, 
you know, the Carling Cup final was coming up and then, you know, Steve McLaren said, listen to me, as long as you're fixed. I, I, be, I was playing most, nearly every single game um, for that two and a half years up to that. And then um, he said, listen, if you, if you train the week before, you, you'll be involved uh, in the final. And I thought, oh, brilliant. And as long as I train the week before, you know, I'll be in the final. Brilliant. But Stu Downing was coming up as well. He was a terrific player. I knew that. Yeah. Anyway, I watched him train every day. And then in the final, he, um, he didn't even put, I was fit. I trained the whole week. I thought if I don't play, I'll definitely be on the bench. And he didn't put me on the bench. And, you know, it was a bit of a massive blow. It was a bit, massive disappointment for me because, you know, um, after the Crown Cup final, I think the week later, I played in the Premier League. <laughs> so it was just mad. And then obviously in the summer, that was my exit. Yeah, well, we spoke to Stewie about the same thing because obviously Stewie was on the bench for the Carling Cup final. Cause that was yeah. the, the catalyst. And we spoke to him about the same thing yeah. that in, injuries mean. An opportunity for somebody else, and you know, that, yeah. that, that, yeah. and and that's you know, I mean, we we spoke, we just spoke about Mike Fry there. That injuries open the door for somebody else to take your place, yeah. and and unfortunately, they are part of the game, and it makes it it makes it riveting for me. It makes it interesting because yeah. you know we've all we've all been put in, and we've all been given our opportunities potentially by by somebody getting injured or being out of form. So it's just, yeah. it's the same thing. So you know, what I mean, I, I just think. Um, I just think yes, it's heartbreaking because you want to play in the big games, don't you? you know, I mean, I was there at the Millennium Stadium watching, watching obviously the yeah. team. I was outside for Cardiff, but I, I went there as a fan, and yeah. um, you know, it was just an amazing, oh, amazing, amazing time in the amazing football club. Listen, that, that... Yeah, it was an amazing day, and Stewie Downing deserved to be on the bench because he was playing really well as well, coming in the team, and you know, outstanding left foot, great lad, top geezer. And um, but I think the most disappointing thing for me was Steve McLaren had said to me four weeks previous, if you get back fit. And train the week before, you'll definitely be involved. So to take me all the way down there as part of the squad and leave me out was absolutely devastating. I remember running into the toilets afterwards, having yeah. a little tear up and uh, absolutely, you know, just gutted and um, feeling sick. Um, even though, you know, because you, like you say, you want to play in these big games. I was absolutely delighted after the game that they won the, won, the, won the cup final and, you know, we celebrated afterwards and we did the open top bus. But it just doesn't feel the same when you're not actually playing. I've actually got a picture up here of, of the Millennium Stadium with me standing outside it as a little painting. But <laughs> uh, just to remind them, you, you do get speed bumps in this thing we call life. So, uh, yeah. but, you know, it is what it is. Like you say, it's part of football. But for me, you know, um, it, was a, it was a big disappointment for me and probably, no, I wouldn't say at the end of the road for me because I still had two years and, and a year option on my contract. And um, I went back to, I, I, I worked my, my butt off in this, in the summer after the cup final, because I thought, right, I've had a season where I've had one season of winning two, three player of the years, and then I've had a, a season where, you know, I've been in and out, a couple of injuries, tonsils out, so I'm going to come go back flying fit. And I, I absolutely worked my socks off for eight weeks, was the fittest I've ever been. And uh, literally the day before pre season, Steve McLaren, the day my uh, second was born, actually, 29th of June, was due back on the 1st of July, I had a, mess a phone call of Steve McLaren saying, um, we're, we're, we're going to sell you to West Brom. And I was like, all oh, right, I'll do back training on Monday. <laughs> so then, uh, moving, moving obviously a little bit, a little bit swifter than, uh, than I would like to be an amazing, but, um, but I, I like this, the, the cup competitions, obviously the Champions League we spoke about, the, the Carling Cup we've just gone about there. And then obviously another highlight of your career has been the Europa League as well. So obviously you had a, another unbelievable run in, a, in another amazing cup competition. So tell us a little bit about that at Fulham. So obviously you, you ended up obviously going all the way to the final. So tell us about some of the games or some of the main main highlights of that Europa League competition. Oh, it was crazy. I mean, you know, I had five years at West Brom. We had the great escape, two relegations, uh, lost in the playoff final to Derby, won championship, which was incredible. And then I was, out of the blue, Fulham came in for me in the summer. We just got relegated back from the Premier League to the Champ, uh, 2009. Um, I started the season at West Brom. Robert, Roberto Di Matteo came in as manager. And uh, Fulham came in for me and offered uh, four and a half million for me. Um, West Brom didn't want to let me go, which was fine. I was really happy there. I was captain of the club. Uh, they offered me a new five-year contract to stay. Um, but in the back of my mind, I was thinking, you know, we've got a chance at the Europa League, back in the Premier League. I was 30, 30 years old, 30 and a half. Um, and I said to Roberto Di Matteo, I said, what would you do if you were in my position, you know, if you were a player? And he said, I'd want to play in the Premier League and I'd want to play in the Europa League. I said, exactly. I said, so can you speak to, you know, the chairman, see if you can sort the deal out? And in the end, uh, they agreed to a year loan with the, 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 the transfer payment getting paid the year after. So... Even though I went on a year loan, the, the three-year deal was already sorted. 
So he says, like, you know, it was going on a year alone, but it was already sorted. They just didn't want the fee until the, pro- the, the, yeah, the, yeah. the following year. So I went to Fulham knowing I was going to be there for three years. Um, obviously, big club, Roy Hodgson was the manager. Um, small squad, we only had probably 19 pros, and then we had three or four young kids, Chris Smalling being one of them. Yeah. And uh, we just had a tremendous year. I think we finished seventh in the Premier League. Um, you know, no, no one said at the start of the Europa, Europa League uh, campaign that we'd get all the way to the final. And, um, you know, we just took get one game by, you know, uh, game by game, really. And, you know, we had a real tight knit, knit squad, um, some real good experience as well, like Damien Duff, Danny Murphy, Bobby Zamora, Andrew Johnson, you know, um, at the back, Aaron Hughes, obviously, we used to play for Newcastle. Yeah. Uh, Schwartz, Mark Schwartz, who was in goal, right, yeah. top class keeper. We had real good experience. We had a real good bond. Um, we were lucky we had no real serious injuries. And we just seemed to, like, you know, do well in the Premier League and then just keep getting by every round and then we ended up in the final. Obviously, you know, we lost the final just one, one, one stop too far. But, um, mm. you know, as a year, it was it was amazing to be part of because great set of lads again. And sometimes all those things just work, don't they? The work and, and, yeah. and you don't know how they work because you're not, and not, not, not being disrespectful to the players at all, but sometimes they're, the times that you're together with a, with a group of players potentially aren't as good as other groups that you've played with. Sometimes work better because you've got a better um, work ethic, you've got a better camaraderie as a, as a group of players. And, you know what I mean, when you go over that white line, it's just, it's fun. It's just, you know what I mean, you, 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 you've got a good buzz in training. You know what I mean? You, the, the manager's got the right pieces of jigsaw, put it together, and it just works a treat. And sometimes when you see the best teams in the world having all the best players and it doesn't come together, you know what I mean? People can't understand how that doesn't work, but sometimes there's just no logic behind it. Yeah, I think, you know, if you look at someone like Roy Hodgson, terrific coach, you know, can speak about seven or eight languages, you know, his training sessions, you know, well thought of, you know, probably wasn't what, what I was used to being at West Brom, Man U or Middlesbrough. It was more, you know, a lot of shape, walking through shape and stuff like that, a bit probably more the Italian way. But like you say, we had a great team spirit, you know, you know, great work ethic, great attitude, application. You know, we knew everything about our roles, roles and responsibilities for each position. You know, if we were coming in and sent the mid, you knew what you had to do. You know, we always played four four two. We knew what we needed to do with the ball, without the ball, and we literally just took took it game by game. And you know, you know, Roy Hodgson's team is very well organised, well, so we're hard to beat. So uh, you know, we we, we ground through to uh, to a successful, well, a very successful season, really. Just. Obviously, couldn't beat Atletico Madrid in the final, but they had some good players, yeah. to be fair. Um, that's, go on, go on, say. No, go on, Anthony. Go on, you carry on, mate. I like, and then I'll finish off with the. No, no, I just, no, I just, I just obviously wanted to know about uh, like, like Atletico Madrid. You know what I mean? That you, that you play against like the elite. You know what I mean? And I would just stop teams like that. You know that 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 when you. You know what I mean? You know that you can sometimes you can tell, you know what I mean? I'll, I'll use Middlesbrough example, uh, when they played Seville in the in the UEFA Cup final that you look at the team sheet, you've got Danny Alves, you know what I mean, who obviously went on to have an unbelievable career. You know what I mean? And sometimes you just know the way the game's gonna go from start to finish. And you know what I mean, how did you feel when you when you're playing against these kind of players? That how how'd you how'd you stop it? Uh well, that's that's a good question. You just try your hardest to stop it, don't you? I think, you know, if you look at the Atletico Madrid team, you know, they had De Gea in goal, they had um um Aguero and fall on mm. up front. I think uh, yes. who else was there? The the winger on the uh, on the left wing was decent as well. Gordon, you know they had some unbelievable yeah, players. Yeah, Gordon, Gordon plays um, enough. Yeah, and like you say, you know it's like when you play any like for me as a Premier League player, you know for West Brom or Middlesbrough, wherever it was, and you look at say Arsenal team, you know when you played against Vieira and Burkamp and stuff like that, you just know you have to be on your game, don't you? Stand a <laughs> chance and hopefully yeah. they're a little bit off the game. Yeah, but a good a good story about Danny Alves was. Uh, I remember Danny Alves when he was first coming through Seville. We played. We were away with West Brom. Brian Robson was the manager at the time, I think. So back in 2004 or something like that, and we played a pre-season game in, Port- in Portugal, and it was absolutely boiling, about 38 degrees. I was playing left wing, and uh, we'd been out the day before. We'd had a, an all-day session like uh, down at the beach and a few. Not like and not like Robbo. Not like Robbo. Yeah. <laughs> and we uh, we ended up going to, to play Seville the next day, about six o'clock at night, and. Um, I was playing left wing and someone said, oh, there's a little Brazilian playing right back side. He's half decent. Honestly, mate, <laughs> all the game up and down the right-hand side, uh. I was absolutely bollocks. I was like sweating like mad. I, the gaffer, I think, said at half time, he said, bloody hell, he's not bad, the right back, is he? I said, do you want to come and play left wing? Because I'm just, just tracking him back. He was something yeah. some special. And he, yeah, and I, you know what I mean? Like the, the career he's had, unbelievable. But you know what I mean? I think it probably took him a while like, to to probably come out of himself because he had Cafu ahead of him. You know? Do you know what I mean? That like it's yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just a follow on, follow on thing, isn't it? Last player. 
All right. Um, so I've got one question uh, for you, Jono, uh, before we kind of wrap up, and then I'm going to go through a couple of the quiet live chat questions just quickly. Okay. As people have taken the time to uh, to ask questions, so I don't want to miss them. I'm going to try and get no to them as I can quick. But um, I was interested, really. Obviously, you're a United fan, um, and you played there. You played with Roy Keane. Um, and I was wondering how you kind of felt and viewed the Roy Keane when he left or he was sacked by United, the way he left. Because obviously you played with him as well. You knew the standards he demanded. I just wondered your opinion on that because obviously he criticised a lot of the younger generation coming through, who are, some of which are now first-team players. Yeah, true. I think uh, for me, Roy Keane's Roy Keane. You know, you get what you get. You know, you see, what you see is what you get. You know, um, like you, you mentioned, he demands high standards, especially in training games. You know, um, he's he's a born winner. He used to hate losing five sides, seven aside, nine aside, ten aside, whatever game it was. Young v old on a Friday before a Premier League game, he'd go mental if he didn't win the game. You know, his attitude was spot on. That's one of the biggest reasons why Man U was so successful at that time. I think the way he went out is is a Big disappointment, not just to him, but to the club as well and, and for the fans, because he is really a true legend, but he's not really, you know, it's cast a shadow over him a little bit, you know, um, with the, the MUTV um, interview. But actually, when you hear him speak about it, you know, doesn't, he, he thinks he's been, you know, done by a little bit because, you know, um, it was supposed to be in-house. It was, you know, if you looked at any interviews he'd done before that, he'd probably said the same thing about certain other people as well. He wasn't to name or shame or anything like that. It was to make them better players, you know, and to be Man United players. And I think um, that's why he sticks to his guns to this day and he still doesn't speak to Alex Ferguson. So I think at the time there was a few problems between Alex Ferguson and Roy Keane at the time and that was probably an easy way to get him out of the building. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's a bit gutting because he's such a massive part of United. You know, all the years he was there, all the trophies he's won, you know, he's captain the team for years. So it just casts that shadow over him, you know, when he should be celebrated for being the legend he actually is. Um, so it is a disappointing end to what, you know, you know that, that MUTV interview, however you take it, it's, it's put some over, over the key Man U, Ferguson era. It's sad that they don't speak as well, because I think they are two in United's history, as you know, they're two of the most uh, successful and iconic figures they've ever had. As, as yeah. a duo as well as individually and it, it's a shame that they, that relationship has exactly because so Alex Ferguson without Roy Keane wouldn't have won what he'd won and Roy Keane without Alex Ferguson wouldn't have won what he's won so you know like you say you took, you've hit the nail on the head you know um, they did compliment themselves really well you know they were, they were part of a winning team they had a winning mentality both of them did they take it a step far too far sometimes probably yeah because they're born winners um, but you have to be man enough to take it um, you know, you know, Cammy knows being a footballer, you, you, you got to have fixed, fixed skin to be in a dressing room with a bunch of 22 lads and coaching staff and fans being on your back, you know, left, right, and centre. So, um, you know, it's a shame the way the way that that ended because it, it could have been a lot, lot better. I think sometimes, though, when someone's got such high standards, though, and when two people have got such high standards, they're going to clash. And you yeah, know what I mean. And the only, and the only winner is is was Sir Alex. And you know what I mean. There was there was better players than Roy Keane, probably who've seen the seen, got you on the door. You know what I mean. Uh, with Yap, Yap Stam, you know what I mean. There was, you know what I mean. There's no bigger David Beckham. There's no bigger player than um, than than the manager. You know what I mean. No, no, you know what I mean. There's no one bigger than the football club, unfortunately. And you know what I mean. He's he, he he's ruthless, and, and that's why he's been so successful. So for me, I think it just happens. The biggest compliment I can pay Roy Keane is he makes he makes you better when you're on the pitch. He makes you better in training and he makes you better on the pitch. He makes you, you know, not rest on your laurels. He makes you be on your game 100% from start to finish. Uh, and I think that's why he got the best out of all the other players. You know, you mentioned the class of 92 earlier. Without Roy Keane, they might not have been, you know, you, people say Eric Harris and Alex Ferguson, Eric Cantona helped them out. But without Roy Keane demanding the best from them every day in training and games, they might not have been as good as what, what they were. Yeah. Spot on. So, let's uh, let's get through some of these live chat questions then to finish up. Uh, so, we had uh, someone asked, I forget who, I think it was James asked, did you ever play in Ninian Park and what was your opinion of it? Apart from it being the greatest ground to ever grace the football world. <laughs> but apart from, you know, apart yeah. From, 
<laughs> so I like it's amazing, amazing place to play football. Hostile but amazing. Yeah, I played I played there a few times. Um I honestly can't remember the results. You want to one if one. <laughs> if we I remember playing against Aaron Ramsey when he first was coming through. What a player. Um and I remember playing against Ricky Simica. Oh yeah. Yeah, and Darren Purse when he was there. Purse, yeah. Legends. Um, but I, I honestly can't remember how the results went or yeah. what, but I remember it being a good atmosphere and the fans being loud and um, and uh, a good place to play. Uh, Ryan asks, uh, playing with Janino, uh, what was it like and who was uh, your inspiration uh, for becoming a pro footballer? Well, playing with Janino, like Cammy will tell you, was brilliant. You know, what a little magician he was. Um, you know, as a footballer, you could take players on left, right, you know, he could dribble, you know, he could pass, he could score goals, he could assist. Um, he was hard to mark because he was so small and so nimble, you know, yeah. um, low centre of gravity, so he could turn it quite quick. Um, but on the other side of it, you know, he was a great human being, you know, he was a great guy, very happy, joking, a very nice human being who was always nice and kind to people. And uh, I remember him as... You know, he was a proper star, obviously, of the team and obviously of Brazil as well. But I just remember him as little old Juni. He was just an absolute top gear, would, uh, top guy. would come for a beer, would come for some food. You know, would always be cracking jokes and having a laugh in, in the changing room. And uh, just a really, really pleasant uh, pleasant guy to play with. And, you know, I, I've got his shirt signed, um, you know, from when I was playing at Middlesbrough. And um, it's one of my best shirts I've got without a shadow of a doubt. Top lad, top player. You know, what I mean, I, that football club would would not be on the map if it wasn't for that little fella. You know, what I mean, the Brian Robson brought him in, and you know, what I mean, the plan was to build a football club around around the sign, and then you know, what I mean, that the oh god, yeah, I, I can't I can't say enough good things about him, what he brought for the town, and um, you know, what I mean, when he even the second time he came back, you know, that it, it worked in 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 certain respects. People say don't go, don't ever return, don't go back, but. He just had a horrific injury at uh, Athletic Club Madrid, broke his ankle, I think, and yeah, um, right. came back. And, and you know what I mean? It took him a little while to get back to the Premier League the way that it was. And, and, and the Premier League had got better, by the way. It evolved a little bit and got got a lot stronger, but top player, world-class player. And that, and that was just a great words, guy, weren't you, Cammy? Yeah, just and those words, those words, yeah. world-class players, branded around too much, you know, but he was, he was yeah. world-class. He was, he would walk into any top Champions League side now. without. I always ball. remember we played... Um... I think it was my second year there and we played Leeds at Ellen Road. I think we won, I don't know, maybe three or four nil or three or four one. And uh, he got he got a standing ovation by the whole Ellen Road oh, ground. It's the first time I've ever seen me. anybody get a standing ovation um, just... at Ellen Road. He got literally the whole stadium stood up applauding him. It was brilliant. Oh, he's just, uh, I, I, I can't say enough good things about him. You know, I remember, I remember the first time it, uh, it snowed, or the first time he came across snow at Middlesbrough. You know what I mean? And he wore a full balaclava at a train and you just see his eyes and he was he had a coat on and oh, he was just it was a sight, it was a it was a definite a definite great sight to watch. You know what I mean? And he still guy. performed he still performed as well, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, and he if he played now he'd be still one of the world's best as well, in my opinion. Oh, he'd be, be amazing. The Premier League needs people like him. Yeah, absolutely. Um okay, so we'll finish on this comment, uh, which came in earlier from Joshua. Uh, he said Andy Jono. Uh, have you heard that Ayala isn't playing for the next two games he's contracted for? Uh, he hasn't renewed his contract. And uh, also, Jono, have you been asked by Mikel Beck to play in the charity game next year? Well, yes, I've been asked to play in the charity game. So that's an easy one. So don't know a date yet for it, obviously, because of this uh, virus. But um, yeah, if I'm available and in the country, I'll definitely be playing. Um, and on the other situation with Daniel Ayala, I actually played with Daniel at Nottingham Forest. Really good kid. Um, um, good professional as well, good player. Um, and I think it's probably similar to the Lyle situation. Is you know he's probably you know there's rumours that Leeds have been in touch and stuff like that. Um, he's probably doing what Lyle's doing. He don't want to get injured for them two games because he knows he's going to sign for another club on July the first. And it's just back to the same same situation. Is it right? Is it morally right? You know, uh, for me, I would play the two games and then go and sign for another club. But I totally understand the other side of it. If you get injured and you're out for a year, then you can't sign for another club. So he's, he's probably looking after himself and his family. And I totally get that as well. But for me, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, you and? 
Um, this is a little bit more complicated, and I'll, and I'll explain why. So, uh, Daniel's wife put uh, a picture on social media about him selling the house. So, you know what I mean? Straight away, a can of worms open straight away that he's leaving. You know what I mean? There's, there's your first indication that he's leaving. Bad timing. Everyone jumped on board of it in the area that uh, who's he signing for? You know what I mean? So, then the, the, they pulled out a statement to say that um, they're just they're, they're staying in the area. Um, they just wanted to move to a different house. Um, the rumours I'm hearing is he signed for Leeds. Good luck to him. You know what I mean? He's been, a, he's been an unbelievable servant for Middlesbrough. Um, I think it's a, this is a little bit more tricky um, than the Lyle Taylor one because Middlesbrough and Leeds are in the same division currently. Middlesbrough and Leeds are both playing together and uh, at the same time in this, in this, in, in, with the season still going on. Um, so potentially he could play two games for Middlesbrough and then go and sign for Leeds and finish the season at Leeds. It's, this is where the, the whole thing just gets a little bit messy for me. That um, This is where FIFA should have just took it out of everyone's hands and just said, listen, yeah. points per game throughout the league, from Premier League all the way down to step seven, is final and that's it, game over. And then it would have been fair. It, well, fairish. The fairest way of doing it. Whereas it's, 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 it's a mess. You know what I mean? We're, we're on about Lyle Taylor. And, and yes, I was critical of Lyle. And I'm probably going to contradict myself here. This is probably Daniel's last move. So Daniel's probably last potential contract. So uh, 30s, and he's, I think he's 30. Is he 30? 33, 34? That's yeah. Excuse it, and. You know, I don't think it does excuse it, it, but this is... No, well, I totally, I totally player, agree. Yeah. I, like, I'd, I'd be very surprised if Daniel doesn't play um, the rest of this month. I'd be very surprised. He, he's the kind of player who runs through a brick wall for that football yeah. club. He's run through a brick wall for the Jonathan Woodgate. So I'd be, I'd be extremely surprised if he doesn't play. Um, uh, and if he doesn't play, then the same rules apply. You know what I mean? For me, he should play the rest of the month. It's The can of worms is, is, is down to the FA, UEFA, FIFA, PFA clubs to agree on certain things and and players to have that um cushion that if an injury does happen that that teams are going to back them up but they're not going to so you know what i mean players have got to look after themselves and um and he's got an opportunity to get a big a big big a big contract and at a premier league club because let's be honest leeds are going to the premier league like it or not mm. you know what i mean you know what i mean we're obviously not a big leeds fan leeds fans on this show uh but End of the day, they're going to the Premier League. Good luck to them. They're the best side uh, in the Championship. So, you know what I mean? He's, he's, he's picked well if that's where he's going to go. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, just, it's an awkward... 29. 29 he is. Uh, 20, 29 he is, uh, y'all. I've just, had, uh, I've just had about 15 text messages saying he's only 29. Yeah, same, yeah. <laughs> I've had... i just gone through my DMs and my texts. I wish I was 29 now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was 39. So far, I've had 13 texts I've had. Uh, telling me that I'm Man United bias. <laughs> fair, one, fair one. It's not fair at all. Rubbish. So anyway. And Wales biased. Yeah, well, obviously it's got to support the best, <laughs> the best teams. I'm a glory supporter. No, you're neutral. Glory you're neutral. You, 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 you're a pundit. You're neutral. Yeah, I'm. The, I'm the host. I don't have to be. Uh, <laughs> I have to be impartial. <laughs> so um, right, guys, drop a like on the video, of course, and uh, share away. Share, comment. Help us spread and grow. Uh, we will have the audio version will drop tomorrow morning. Also, you'll be able to listen to that on uh, Borough, T Borough Fan TV, I think it's called. And is it? Yeah, Red, Tuesday. Is it, is it Tuesday? Red Army TV? Yeah, Red Army TV, 9 o'clock Tuesday, uh, if you want to watch the repeat. But the uh, Ace Podcast Nation, the only place to get it live. Uh, subscribe, youtube.com slash Ace Podcast Nation. Uh, please follow the new page for the show, which is... Uh, on all platforms if you go with at ac footy show you'll find us there check out black diamond sports as well and of course we thank them for supporting and sponsoring the show you can find them on social media at the various uh, different addresses which will come up on the screen at the end and uh, we'll have some news some news drop in in the next few days about uh how can i put it without spoiling it our championship coverage how about yep. that and how about that yeah yeah. Jono, I appreciate you coming on, mate. Thank you ever so much. Yeah, thanks, Jono, mate. You've been pleasure. amazing. Loved it, mate. Yeah. Loved it. Absolutely. Absolute loved it. pleasure. Cheers, guys. I Cheers, could have talked to you for another two hours as well, but you know, <laughs> no, I've already gone over time. Get in trouble. Yeah. We'll um, get shot, won't we? <laughs> Thank you to everyone who's watched on YouTube, Periscope, Facebook, all the people who are going to download the audio as well, of course. I appreciate your support, and uh, we will see you next Monday, 7 30, for another guest. Are you going to tell us who the guest is, and or are they going to tell them, or are we going to save it?
No, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it. I'm going to. I'm, I'm, the next three weeks are a uh, 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 continuing on the on the Jonathan Green in mantle. You know what I mean? Just, uh, just, just as big. Just as big. High, just as big. High bar. It's a high it is a high bar. bar. You're right. It's a high bar. Guys, thanks. See you next week. See you guys. Andy Campbell. It's in. 